Good evening and welcome to the Millbrae City Council meeting of January 14th, 2020. Uh, can we have the roll call, please? All council members are present. Can you please stand and join in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, I'd like to invite uh, Chief Kammeyer up to the podium. Uh, well, we have been very fortunate to have been served by uh, Chief Kammeyer for the last several years here in Millbrae. And um, while we are, are sad that he ha is retiring, we wish him all the best in his retirement. And we have a little commendation here for him. Okay, whereas Chief John Kammeyer retired from the Central County Fire Department on December 18th, 2019, after 16 years of service, whereas Chief Kammeyer started his fire career in 1990 and advocated for having paramedics on fire engines, he initiated community outreach for CPR training and he promoted firefighter fitness programs. Whereas Chief Kammeyer has served Central County Fire Department since its formation in 2004, serving the cities of Burlingame, Hillsborough, and Millbrae, Whereas Chief Kammeyer has gone up through the ranks of Central County Fire Department in various roles throughout the years as EMS Division Chief in 2007, Deputy Fire Chief in 2014, and Fire Chief in 2015. Whereas Chief Kammeyer developed and implemented numerous programs that improved fire and emergency service throughout Millbrae and the district, such as a public-private partnership for tactical response to high-risk events and coordinating multi-agency training drills. Whereas Chief Kammeyer's achievements are numerous and effective in promoting public safety of the communities, he served through education, prevention, and emergency response. Whereas Chief Kammeyer provided exceptional leadership and outstanding service to the city of Millbrae, and therefore we, the members of the Millbrae City Council, do hereby honor and commend Fire Chief John Kammeyer for 30 years of dedicated fire service and extend our best wishes to John as he embarks on his new journey. And I would just say, you know, it hasn't been the easiest time here in Millbrae. We had our um, recreation fire, center fire um, during John's time as, as fire chief, but had, you know, immediate response, excellent response uh, to that um, tragedy here in Millbrae. We also have had a number of, um, as you know, wildfires throughout the state and uh, throughout the world, uh, frankly. And, um, you know, we've stepped up and provided um, emergency support to, to all of those disasters. And, you know, it does strain a small, you know, fairly small department to have, um, you know, having to deploy, uh, you know, f firefighters to different um, parts of the country, but um, we've pulled through it very well, and I think we are, have been a very safe community, and, and we've been in very good hands, so um, I'd like to thank John, and uh, I know also Dino De Ranieri from CERT would like to say a few words as well. Uh, Chief K. Meyer, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your strong support of the Millbrae Emergency Preparedness Volunteer Programs that we have here in Millbrae. Uh, the Community Emergency Response Team, the uh, known as CERT, uh, the um, LEND Radio, which is a community radio setup that we have over 100 people with radios in the city of Millbrae, and also the Millbrae Amateur Radio Club, known as MARC. Uh, your help has made um, our Millbrae programs actually a shining star throughout the county. Uh, at this time, I would like to present to you an honorary uh, cert vest uh, and uh, which entitles you to become, to know, you know, to become a volunteer trainer at 
our training program. So you may hear from us. <laughs> um, also, we have from our membership uh, a retirement card from all our volunteers uh, who wish you, we all wish you, a wonderful retirement. But remember that there's a place for you with sir. Uh, <laughs> we have um, also uh, some flowers for your wife, Jennifer. And you can bring those home because, as they say, she's uh, right now. <laughs> oh, she's oh, sorry. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, behind every man, there's a great woman. Um, <laughs> old saying, you know, but I've got to say it. Um, and in closing, uh, really, all roads lead back to Millbrae, and it will always be nice to see you again, anytime, anywhere. Very good. Thank you for everything. Yeah. Thank you, Dino, and to the CERT team, thank you. Um, as I was driving uh, driving here tonight, it was kind of just going through the memories of the last five years, and as uh, Council Member Lee and I were just talking, it's been, uh, it's been really interesting because we were here kind of when this all started five years ago um, under some challenging circumstances, but, uh, and of course, the tragic, you know, rec center fire that, that we've gone through, but we, we've really built some great relationships in, in this community and uh, it it really goes down to one thing and that's the members of CCFD, the members, the men and women of the, the fire department. Um, it's been uh, my complete privilege and honor to to work with them and to guide them and to serve this community. It's um, I was thinking about Dino on the way here too and just the relationships you build with people um, and in, in five years uh, I, I'm hope we kind of served you well because I think our job is to make sure that um, organizations like the CERT team have the support that they need to do their job. It's a, it's a vital role. Um, and I, uh, when I, when I had my badge first pinned on me 30 years ago, I had already achieved everything that I ever wanted to in my life. And, and that was to be a firefighter and to be here 30 years later is a little, a little surreal, but uh, I, I can look back uh, and be proud of what, kind of our, our department has accomplished here in Millbrae. Um, and I would like to recognize also our, my peer department head uh, members that um, besides the CERT teams and the community groups, it's the department heads that really make the city work as well as it does. And it's been great building relationships and, and working with them. And they've been great to me. And, and, uh, um, and certainly working with uh, Tom as the city manager, um, it's been refreshing the last two years working, been at least two years. I, was trying to remember how long it's been, but um, it's been it's been refreshing um, in working with with Tom and the department heads who who are really committed to this community, and you should be proud of them, um, as I know you are. But uh, for me, um, I'm I'm excited for what the next uh, chapter holds for me, and, and I'm doing some fun stuff right now. And um, retiring is I don't I really know what that means exactly, but uh, uh, I'm going to keep, uh, keep doing what I'm doing and serving in, uh, in whatever capacity I can. So I would just like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, for this honor. Thank you to the council for um, for your relationships and your uh, and your friendships, because that's really what has gotten me through these last five years. And to all the members of CCFD who have uh, are today and will ongoing serve this community very well at the highest level possible. So thank you very much. Would you like to do a, a photo, yeah. uh, comments? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through the chair. Chief, um, I just can't emphasize enough the, the shoes that uh, you, you created a big footprint, um, and not to say that your predecessor uh, won't be able to fill it or, or do just as well, but you came in at a very difficult time, you did say, but um, you, you were thrown into Gene Chief unexpectedly um, at a time when we were transitioning our whole department into uh, the central fire. And, and you can just imagine just the chaos and all the, and all the um, un, you know, just unknown factors that goes in trying to meld three cities together. 
Um, so I just can't emphasize enough how much we appreciate your steady hand um, and how you manage your staff and also fulfill all your missions and goals. Um, so thank you again, Chief. So just to coattail a little bit what you had to say, yes, there was a lot of chaos and uncertainty that everybody was experiencing, but your leadership was superior. And I thank you very much. You were a huge role model for me. Thank you. Uh, ditto to that. I will also say thank you for the pink fire engine, for being such a great um, partner with the CERT program. I mean, we are fortunate to have the training center at Station 37, and as a CERT, three of us are CERT members, how much fun it was to put out fires at the fire station, um, and also your support for all of the public events that I have dragged you into. So I am very thankful for that. And for the um, for the firefighters who've come to my door, I have two, had two, now one, elderly people. So you have been there when my dad fell and broke his hip, all and all and on, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Oh, <laughs> short and sweet. Um, you have meant a great deal to our community as your, all the firefighters have. So we thank you so much. And it's it's been a difficult road. You're representing three different cities here. And we've had to do the fire assessments. So all the help with those efforts to make this work wild and improve public safety is so important to us. And thank you so much for all your years of service. Greatly appreciated. A, a quick photo with the council and maybe the cert and, and mayor if i may real quick um oh, sure yes yeah chief um you'll never be john and me you will always be chief and i say that with the utmost of respect um you're an inspiration um in your leadership and management abilities not just to the fire service but across the board to uh, all of us in the municipal business so it's been a pleasure um i hope to continue a, a great relationship with you and thank you for everything that you've done and uh I'm going to miss you, and uh, it's been a great pleasure. So thank you. Have the, uh, the firefighters joining us as well? CCFD? We need a council meeting. Joe, get out Get in the picture. Yeah. You were part of the history. Oh, yeah. John and I go way back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of room over here, I guess. Yeah. 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 Good thing. Tom, what do you want there? I want to take a picture before I got in there and he broke Do you want to open the, the accommodation? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll make it work. <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, next we have the agenda overview and staff briefing, uh, City Manager Williams. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Holliber, members of the City Council. Happy New Year to all of you. Um, after uh, item number two, which is uh, this agenda overview and staff briefing that includes a calendar of events, reports of bills and claims, uh, we do have no report out of the city attorney. There was no reportable action on November 12th. We have the approval of the meeting minutes, item number three, and that's the regular meeting minutes of November 12th, 2019, and December 10th, 2019. There are no oral reports this evening for any committee, from any committee or commission chairs. Following that item, we have public communication, and that's available for any 
member of the public to speak on any item not on the agenda for a time limit of three minutes. We then move to the consent calendar. Item number five on the consent calendar is to consider a resolution accepting the 2019 pavement repair project as complete. Item number six is to consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to uh, approve a contract uh, increase in the amount of $6,000 for the remainder of the fiscal year through June 30th for our emergency services director coordinator position. Item number seven on the consent calendar is to accept by motion the comprehensive annual financial report known as the CAFER report for fiscal year 2018-19. Item number eight is consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to prepare and submit to the Department of Housing an SB2 planning grant in the amount of 160,000. Item number nine on the consent calendar is to consider the quarterly investment schedule for the first quarter of fiscal year 2019-20. Following item number nine, we move to public hearing. We have one item under public hearing, that's item number 10, and that is to consider adoption of the proposed updates to the City of Millbrae uh, schedule of fees for building, planning, and the finance department. Item number 11 under existing business is to receive the informational report on the draft final classification and compensation study. Under new business, item number 12 is the council discussion and appointments to council subcommittees for the year 2020. That's an action item. Item number 13 is an informational report on the Broadway tree planting and downtown tree planting project. Item 14 is to consider a resolution uh, from seamless Bay Area transportation. Item number 15 is to consider adoption of a resolution for the submittal of an application for the Recreation Trails Program Grant. And the last item on the calendar, item number 16, is to consider adoption of resolutions approving the submittal of an additional grant under the Land Water Conservation Fund grant uh, to support outdoor recreation projects. Following that, then we move into council comments, and that would conclude the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Moving on, we have a report out from the city attorney on the closed session of November 12th, 2019. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That uh, takes us back to last year on November 12th at the conclusion of the city council meeting. The council met in closed session to discuss labor negotiations, and as your city manager mentioned a minute ago, uh, there was no action to report out from that session. Okay, thank you. Um, now moving on to the approval of minutes, we have uh, the minutes from November 12th, 2019 and December 10th, 2019. We have a motion from Council Member Pappen and a second from Council Member Lee. Uh, your votes, please. The minutes passed unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have public communication. This is the opportunity uh, for members of the public to speak on any item that is not on this evening's agenda. And speakers have three minutes. Um, the first speaker we have is Jean Perry. Good evening. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about the um, survey of adult and aging populations that is currently being conducted here in San Mateo County. Um, this is um, this survey will provide data for the strategic plan for the next three years, and um, it's the most participation we can get, the the better. I was in Fresno last week and saw a big billboard in Spanish that was referring to the census, but the message is exactly the same. Take 10 minutes now and reap the rewards for the next 10 years, and that is so true of this. So we were able to actually pass out 200 of these surveys at the, the um, resource fair on Saturday, um, and we're taking them to in, in, um, in Chinese to the self-help for the elderly luncheons and different methods of reaching people. The, the link for the survey in English is available uh, online, and I believe um, Nextdoor actually posted it, but I can provide it too if, if you don't have it. So, so um, even if you aren't over 55, if you play a role in supporting an individual who is over 55 or an adult with disabilities, you know, get, get your data in so that um, the planning can take place for what resources are gonna be needed going forward. 
Thank you. Great, thank you. Mayor, just, uh, we, we'd be happy to work um, with the county to provide a link on our homepage as well, or easy okay. access. Okay, um, let's see any other speaker slips? So seeing none, uh, public communication is closed. Oh, I have one item, sorry. For public communication? Yeah, I, actually I, I wanted to say this in lieu of my comments real quick because I, don't, I want to make sure this message gets out. It's just a very quick thing. Is it from somebody else? Or? No, it's from me. Okay. Yeah, I just want thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go I just to the no. Podium, uh, is it okay if I just sit here? It's really quick. So I just wanted to thank. Uh, I forgot to thank my family for the help from last year. So I just want to put that out there because <laughs> you know we always take our family for granted. Um, and also, I forgot to mention uh, a very important organization, the Millbrae Community Foundation, and their work uh, they did for us in the past few years and this year. So thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, we're now moving on to the consent calendar. And we have, let's see, items five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, we have a motion from Councilman Lee and a second from Vice Mayor Schneider. Uh, your votes, please. Items number five, six, seven, eight, and nine on the consent calendar passed unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have item number 10, which is a public hearing on adoption of proposed updates to the Millbrae uh, service and fee schedule for building, planning, and finance department fees. And do we have to open the public hearing, or is it already open because it's continued from open, a... Open the hearing. Okay. This is a new hearing. Oh, okay. It, you're going to open it now? Okay. Yeah, do we have a motion? Have staff report. Okay. Part of it. Thank you. All right, your votes, please. The motion to open the public hearing passed unanimously. Okay, and uh, we have our finance director, assistant city manager, um, Deanna Hilbrands here. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, this is a, a continuation of business, but we did not continue this item. We separately noticed the uh, community development related fees, building and planning fees. On November 12th, you heard a presentation to update public works, recreation, um, city clerk, and finance fees. We decided to take a bit more time on the building and planning fees. They had quite a few fees. Um, as last time, I wanted to thank the departments for working so hard on this. I, I, you'll see, you'll, you've seen in your packet, there were a number of fees to to work through. Um, like last time, I'll be bringing Courtney Ramos up from Matrix Consulting. We um, hired them in 2018 to work on this project, and um, this is the conclusion of the fee schedule part of the project. So we did, the first step was a cost allocation plan, and um, where we calculated administrative cost to, to spread across the various departments, including departments charging fees or enterprise funds like water and sewer, followed by this fee study update. And um, we are also working with them on a revenue enhancement study, looking at other revenue opportunities. So um, again, we're looking tonight mostly at planning and building fees. And one finance fee that was um, inadvertent, it wasn't inadvertently left off, I'm sorry, we actually worked more with the county to confirm this fee. So as those fees were finished, rather than include it in the study, we used the same type of calculation to, to validate this fee with the county and their rates. It's a service mostly provided by the county through our sheriff's office contract. Um, and so that's the alarm monitoring fee, um, our monthly alarm monitoring. It's a little bit different than our alarm monitoring permit. So with that, I'll bring up Courtney to discuss building and, and planning fees. Um, we have staff here with any questions, and I'll come at the end to discuss the staff recommendation. One thing to clarify is Matrix worked within legal parameters to identify, for example, the maximum fee we could charge. The staff is making recommendations, and those recommendations are based on council goal of fiscal sustainability. And as it relates to building and planning fees, we looked at 100% cost recovery and making our staff recommendations. So with that, um, we'll bring up Courtney. All right, thank you. Good evening, happy new year. Um, I, will, I will jump into this as it'll be a little bit repetitive for some of you who have who've been through this presentation a couple of times now. But what, what I wanted to do uh, is just give a brief introduction, um, talk a little bit about the scope of services, the study objectives, um, talk about the legal framework that surrounds um, setting user fees, um, 
give you an idea of the basic costing methodology, uh, and then talk a summary of the finding and results, real high level, and then turn it back over to Deanna. Um, so as she said, staff can talk about what their recommendations are, because again, what we're doing with the study is really kind of showing what the ceiling is. What is the full cost to provide that service? Uh, and what staff are then here to do is to present their recommendations for what should be charged for that service. So difference between cost and fee, cost and price. Um, so a quick introduction, uh, and I'll breeze through this because, like I said, I think most of you have seen me up here a couple times already. Uh, but I'm here representing Matrix Consulting Group. My name is Courtney Ramos. Um, the Matrix Consulting Group, we're just down the road in San Mateo. Uh, we've been around for about 17 years providing um, services to local government, including cost of service, process analyses, management and staffing aud audits, uh, as well as public safety reviews. Uh, I was the project manager for this portion for both the cost allocation plan and the user fee study, uh, and I was supported um, internally from Matrix by Kushbu Hussein as well as Jessica Mazenko, uh, who worked on this, as well as countless members of city departments and staff who were uh, uh, crucial parts to getting this study completed. Uh, so. What, what is a fee study other than a, a giant long report uh, with a lot of numbers in it? Uh, it provides a tool for understanding the current services that you provide, the service levels associated with that specific to planning and building, the number of plan reviews that are associated with a particular fee, the number of inspections that can be expected to be received for a fee that you are paying for that service. Um, it can help you understand a little bit the demand for those services and what, what fees can and should be charged. Um, for the most part, like I said, uh, we talk about what the ceiling is, what is the full cost of providing that service, but there are also certain fees that are set by the state um, or that have, that have caps on them. So making sure that we're in compliance, not just with how we calculate the fees, but if there are any state or federal recommended fees, that we don't exceed those fees. Um, the benefits and uses uh, of a fee study, uh, like I just mentioned, first and foremost, we want to make sure that we're in compliance. We're not charging more than we should be charging, either because it's already been limited or capped, um, but also in accordance with the way we're supposed to cost those things out. Um, it helps you understand what is it costing to provide those services. Um, this was not a, uh, it wasn't a staffing study, it wasn't a process study. It looked at how services are being provided and what's the cost associated with that. But it also takes a look at not just the direct cost, the, the staff who are providing that service, but also the indirect overhead associated with that service. So really giving you the full picture of what is the cost associated with that. We looked at streamlining the fee schedules. So to help really make sure um, that we have all the fees in there that we should have in there, that we're accounting for all the services that we should have in there. Um, and so that includes new services, getting rid of old services, and making sure that, that ultimately what we have and what we're able to present to the public is something that's comprehensive and understandable. So I talked a little bit about legal framework. There are uh, several rules and regulations in California, because uh, we like to make rules and regulations here, um, that talk about what you can and cannot charge for, um, for fees for service. There's Prop 13, 4, 218, 26. There's government codes. There's not only the state attorney general's opinion, various city attorneys within the state have come out with their own opinions. Um, but ultimately, they all kind of say the same thing, which is that a user fee can, it has to be, um, there has to be a nexus between the service that's being provided and the fee that's being paid. You cannot charge more for a service than it's costing you to provide that service. If you do, it's considered a tax, and therefore it must be voted on by the public in order to approve. Um, so what we wanted to do, like I said, first and foremost, was make sure that we are complying um, with these rules and these regulations and these guidelines. So the approach that we took uh, in order to cost services out is, called, is what's called a bottom-up approach, where what we do is we look at what is the fully burdened rate associated with various staff um, in each different department, look at the average amount of time that it takes for them to provide that service, and rate times time equals cost. Um, this is opposed to what would be considered a top-down approach, where you would take the total cost of a department, let's say, and spread that over all of the fees for service. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that as an applicant, as a user of that service, that you're only paying for that, that cost associated with that service, not for a portion, a greater portion of the department or overhead costs associated with that. So we want to be really specific about that. Um, the bottom-up approach is the most widely accepted and the most defensible approach for um, defending fees for service. Uh, 
as I said, we also looked at updating the fee structure, getting rid of outdated things, adding in new things. We looked at determining fully burdened hourly rates, so not just looking at salary and benefits, but looking at any departmental overhead associated with that if there are support staff, um, such as permit techs or admin assistants, making sure that we factor that in there, as well as services and supplies, the building, the lights, all that kind of stuff. Um, we looked at volume statistics, so kind of how much of these do you do? Um, how does that impact things? We looked at the gaps between cost and revenue. Um, so what are we generating versus what is it costing us? Um, and that's kind of a big impact because you can have something that might have a really big impact or a big difference between what you're charging now and what it's costing you. But if you don't do it, it's not that big of an impact versus something much smaller on a smaller scale. You could have a minimal um, discrepancy in what you're charging and what it's costing you. But because you do so many of them, it can have a large impact. So kind of taking a look at that. So when we updated the fee schedule, we talked with staff um, to determine what are the services that are being provided to make sure not just do we have the right fees on there, but does it make sense how we've termed them, what they're called. So some, some things were kind of minor tweaks to, to the language to make it easier to understand if you're somebody at the permit counter who has to administer those fees or if you're somebody who's coming in and trying to figure out what it's going to cost you to you know, remodel your bathroom or something like that. What we wanted to do was make it more user friendly. Uh, we expanded some of the categories. Some of them were a little too narrow. Uh, and by expanding them, what we did is we provided greater parity then in what we're showing for the cost of service uh, and ultimately then what you will be able to charge for those fees. Some things we were able to condense uh, and take from you know four or five categories down to one because ultimately now the process is such um, that you don't need all those different designations. So again, streamlining the fee schedule. When we looked at gathering time estimates, um, we talked about breaking the process down. You know, it's um, planners and, and building inspectors. Uh, they're not attorneys and they're not consultants, so they're not used to necessarily logging their time on certain things. Um, so in order for us to get good time estimates, what we wanted to do was break the process down, especially when you're talking about a project that you aren't actively working on for three months, six months, or a year, um, but that you are uh, but that you're touching at some point through the process. So really to kind of break it down for the intake and processing, if you have to route it, um, the review process, how many reviews, how many departments are involved with those reviews, uh, and then ultimately into issuing a, a permit. So we took time estimates by position. We also wanted to make sure that we took into account desired service levels. And when we took those time estimates, we also didn't want to take the simplest project. We also didn't want to take the most complex project. What we wanted to do was take what is an average estimate of the types of projects that we see for that particular service um, that we were trying to cost out. Um, as I said, this was not a process study, wasn't a staffing study. Um, but we were able to go back and forth and, and question time estimates and make sure that those time estimates seem real. We didn't just, you know, you said it takes you four hours, so we're going to assume it takes you four hours. But to judge the reasonableness of those estimates, against other time estimates that we've seen in other jurisdictions. And if there wasn't, to kind of push back and ask why. So you know, in some instances, it might be that you have a stricter code or a more, or, uh, a more lenient code um, in the way that you enforce certain things. Um, so just to make sure that we've pushed back and, and we've asked those questions, vetted it, if you will, to make sure that they are as accurate as they can be. When we talk about the full cost of providing the service, like I said, we start with the direct, the salaries and the benefits of the staff who are providing that service. We factor in departmental overhead, including the department admins, services, supplies, lights, things like that, and then as well as citywide overhead, so finance, HR, city clerk, uh, and all of that support that goes into um, those other departments, which then gets you to the full cost, uh, which again is the ceiling. That's all we're here to do is to tell you what is the ceiling, what is the full cost of providing that service. Uh, and in a couple of slides, I'll hand it over to Deanna, and she can talk about what the recommendation is um, for those fees. Um, so big picture overview. When we look at fiscal year 20 fee-related costs, um, and we compare that with the projected fee-related revenue, the city is under-recovering its costs by about $850,000 annually. Uh, again, this is kind of snapshot in time, right? So we're looking at budgeted expenditures. We're looking at the last year's revenue. Uh, you know, obviously, we're not going to have the same number of projects in the same service categories as we did previously. But if we just do that comparison, that's what the difference was. Um, building is at about 48% cost recovery, uh, with planning at about 15% cost recovery. 
Um, typical cost recovery for building is usually generally between 80 and 100%, uh, with planning somewhere between 50 and 70%. And if there aren't any questions about methodology, I will turn it back over to Dan. Okay, so um, with that, we've um, exhibit A to your staff report was the staff recommended fees. We compared current fees, the total cost, and the um, the recommendation. Um, I don't know if you wanted to walk through these um, page by page or just take questions. Um, Question, when you said attachment yes. A, did you mean attachment one? I'm sorry, attachment one, my, actually attachment two to the staff report is the um, attachment two to the staff report is the current, it's a comparison of the current fee, the cost of service as calculated, the recommended fee, um, and any, any notes. Um, in general, these were, if they were different from the calculated fee, it was related to a state law type of thing. So. Yes, Councilman Lee? I prefer we go page by page or item by item. Okay, so, oops. So beginning with um, the first page, um, these are... Um, Sorry, Ms. Hilbrand, is it possible to make it a, a larger screen or a full screen? Maybe like pull up the PDF instead of the Excel? The PDF. the PDF file might be easier to read. It's got it's got the uh, it's got the watermark that's uh, and all the other stuff. The tabs on the top. So you want this to be yeah. You can actually zoom in a little bit more on that too. Starting on page one of the exhibit, um, we um, these are single family, one or two family dwellings, ADUs and accessory buildings, so typically residential properties. Um, a primary recommendation was to move from a valuation base in a couple of um, kind of standard projects, for example, kitchen remodel, bathroom remodels, re-roof swimming pools, spa hot tub sauna, to a fixed rate. Um, the um, for larger projects, new, new addition or alterations, we are still retaining a valuation-based table. And um, if it's okay, if it is okay with the council, we'll review that table separately. Um, also for electrical, plumbing, and mechanical, we went from a per device, which required a technician to count each outlet. Um, we've used a move to a square foot model, um, again, at the recommendation of staff. Yes, Ms. Pappen. Um, a great presentation, by the way, and the summary of everything. Thank you very, very much. Um, with the new ADUs, which is alternative dwelling unit laws, are we, is that included in this? Are we going to run into issues as we move forward? Do we know? We may not know because the laws are constantly changing. From the most recent information I've received, more of the ADU law is reflective on um, development impact fees, but I don't know, Joan, do you have a different? Um... Well, we're, if, if I may, we're also bringing an ordinance. Um, it's been reviewed by the Planning Commission and will be forthcoming to the City Council um, to adopt actually a local um, ADU ordinance here, Brad, in the next month. So that, that will be forthcoming. Okay, um, yeah, I, and, I just... 
We want to make sure that's addressed. Yeah, we want to make sure that's addressed so that we're not implementing something that will be it's absolutely illegal. useless. Right. Uh, and so one of my questions as we move forward here as to the um, flexibility of these fees, if you could address that some, as we approach them, uh, because certain laws change all the time. So thank you very much. And another thing that we'll be doing in, um, with great advice from the city attorney assigned, which was Jarrett Yan, who was a great help, um, we'll be on the fee schedule that gets posted, we'll be posting the resolution attached to any fee. So for example, if we bring something forward and it just has a single fee, we'll note that on, on kind of a master fee schedule. So we won't be losing fees or where they came from or how did we do this. So we'll, we'll keep a better master document. And um, I really appreciated his work and his feedback. Um, that was only one of the many good suggestions. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider? Just curious, if we're going, looking at single family dwellings, looking at bathrooms, and we're going from valuation to a standard price, does that mean a huge bathroom remodel is paying the same fee as a half bath? Okay. Yeah? So uh, the, answer, the short answer to that is yes. You need the microphone. The short answer to that is yes. Uh, a bathroom, regardless of size, still takes the same number of inspections. Um, it's, it's a set number of inspections. Well, no. If you're putting in a shower stall, you've got to come back for the before and the after water test. But if you're doing a half bathroom with no shower or bathtub, you're not doing that. You're correct in that case, yes. So I don't see how we could be charging a small remodel the same price as a large remodel. Okay. No point taken. Okay, Councilman Lee. Uh, so I just want to make it clear that uh, if you're doing like uh, electrical, in case let's just stay with the bathroom, um, you're not being charged twice, right? You're, not, you're only charged for that one flat fee, um, and you're not going to be charged for the um, square footage calculation, right? Of course, that addition to. So for those flat fees, I believe in the notes. Seems like it. I mean, the way I read it, it's all included. But I just wanted. Yeah. I want to hear. Just I think on the resolution notes, it reads um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing are included in in the kitchen remodel, bathroom remodel, bathroom remodel. Um, maybe it's on the resolution attached. What's that? Yeah. So it is included, and if it's not indicated, we'll not look at that. It up in the in the document. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there yeah, is one sure thing there is some very clear, clear that it's very clear not uh, you know one way or the other. You know, I, I am not in favor. I, I am not in favor of either a flat fee, either a flat or, fee, or, or some sort of uh, some sort of what it is. Actually, I'm sorry. It is included. I'm sorry. The title summary says plan remodel includes plan review and the MEP, and the MEP is mechanical, electrical. You won't pay your kitchen. So you won't pay your kitchen remodel fee plus an electrical based on square footage. And I, and I agree with uh, Councilman Schneider. It should be a, a tier system, depending on how big the project is and how many inspections. I mean, you're probably talking about cost recovery, right? Um, and I, I understand that we're not going to get 100%, and I don't think we can do 100%. I want to make sure that we be able to remodel without um, disincentivizing people to remodel or update their homes. Um, so let me also ask you if. Uh, so on the per f square footage, is that only the parts that's being remodeled? Or is that the, so if you're doing a remodel of like your bathroom, you're not gonna be charged for your whole house, right? Correct, just the square footage that's, that's being remodeled or, um, or permitted. Okay, so if you're doing the whole house, that's why I'm kind of thinking we need to do a tier system here because if you're doing a whole new house, like you're remodeling a whole house, you can, you're, if you add all these percentage together, you're talking about 48% of your, you know, it's, it's, it's four, uh, 48 cents per square foot. That's quite a bit. So if you're doing 1,000 square feet. No, because it could get included. So it's no, no, no. I'm saying if you're doing a whole house. Yeah, the way it breaks down is if you're doing a remodel of your house, um, you're going to pay um, based on the valuation of the work occurring. Then on top of that, yes, we are incurring uh, costs for mechanical electrical plumbing based on per square foot cost. And that number that when we looked at this, I found it to be somewhat low considering the county was probably three times higher than that uh, for their electrical plumbing and mechanical. But they also have a lot higher cost for the services. So, 
Okay, I, I realize that, you know, it's, uh, you say 100% recovery, based on 100% recovery? Okay. I think we need to just talk about that a little bit more. Just in general, or about yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, if this is for a small project, it's not a big deal. Like you're talking ten square feet, or typical bathroom, or whatever. I mean, no, I mean, living room or whatever. But when you're talking about the whole house, you're talking, you know, you're talking about three thousand square feet, and you're talking forty-eight percent. Well, that's probably you know a six-figure construction, uh, <laughs> you know, project that you're talking about if you're talking about remodeling a whole house. So, you know, a couple thousand. Even a thousand dollars for a permit isn't that much if you're doing, you know, two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, but if you're doing, I mean, I've gone through the models. It's not just that. You also have to pay the fees to the schools, high school, elementary district, and uh, and you don't want to dissuade people from. And and the only people who can afford to do that are the ultra rich people who have a lot of money to do that. So if you if you just have a modest home and modest income and you want to remodel your house, you're you can't. I, I mean, I. I, I I would think the fees are a very small cost compared to, you know, the type of remodeling that you have in mind. You know, I think this fee schedule is a little bit different than the recreation fees, for example, because that's more of, you know, kind of a community type of, um, you know, service that's being provided, whereas this is really more of a private benefit to, you know, a property owner. Um, and I, I think, you know, our city should not be... Subsidizing. subsidizing that, you know, very much. I, un I understand that we want to, should be very we don't high. want to subsidize, uh, which we have been, um, but also I don't want to dissuade people from remodeling their house. And I think, uh, Mr. Ray, if I may, and, and uh, Joan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think to respond to the council member's question about school impact fee, that's for new development. This is for fees for service. So a remodel, for example, or any fee under this schedule does not no, no, invoke. They, they charge a, you if you remodel. No. It's not just new. They don't, it's it's they new. They charge you for remodel. I've, I got charged for remodeling. I have to pay a fee to this high school district, and I have to pay a fee to the, uh, the, to the school district. And it's, when I was remodeled, I had to pay both fees. An impact fee? Maybe a property tax? Yeah. No, in remodeling, whatever. They charge you per square foot. So whatever you're doing remodeling, you have to pay that Maybe square for the foot. Under, under state the law. I'm sorry. In footage. Uh, sorry, under please. state law, um, the school districts can collect fees for any addition greater than 500 square feet that's made to a house or new structures. So an interior remodel would not be impacted by school district fees under current regulations of the state. Okay. Ms. Mayor Schneider, did you have a comment? I just wanted to, um, I'm going to chime a little bit of what Councilman Lee says in terms of 100% cost recovery. We don't yet have our approved climate action plan, but a number of these fees touch on things that we're going to want both businesses and residents to do to make us more resilient, to make us more fire safe, or uh, more um, water controlling. So the fees that I had a concern about being 100% are any of the solar fees. I understand when I read this that it says it's dictated by the state. So, uh, but when we get to solar fees, I'll come back. But it was the gray water, the storm water, the, um, believe it or not, water heaters. So if we're trying to electrify buildings and we're charging to go away from gas-powered water heaters or gas-powered furnaces to electric, and we're charging that fee on top of what's already five, six, or seven thousand dollars, it does mean only the wealthy can afford to make those changes. But we're going to need everybody to be making those changes in a climate change world. Well, that's um, that's under plumbing. And well, they're they're scattered electrical. kind of throughout the yeah. list of those, and and I think the problem is we don't have our climate action plan, which means we would look at these fees through the eyes of a climate changed world. There, there's you, a fee for gray water system. I want. Yeah, there is. There is a. It's three hundred and eighty-five dollars. And that's a, it's a good point you're bringing out. So um, I would recommend we kind of just go through the list, and then you can. Add your point there. And, well, my only other one is HVAC. If, as we get warmer, we, we don't air condition, but we've got seniors and people with children. And uh, during that Labor Day weekend two years ago, it was brutal in those homes. And I'm not a fan of air conditioning, but. Can we, one, Mr. Mayor, please? Yes. Through the chair. Um, uh, I'd like to point out, too, that the state offers certain rebates to encourage Correct. people. So. You, there are benefits to many programs out there, which I, I would hope that we um, include when we post these um, different fees and such, because we do want to help people become more efficient in their home ownership. So um, I'm sure we'll be on top of that. But 
it is encouraged at all levels. The county gives rebates and the state. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Lee. Okay, so the other question is, so if, you have put air, if I want to put air conditioning on my system, I don't have to add, change my, my ventilation, much of my ventilation. Are, what, what's the charge, what would the charge be for that? Would that, that's not a device anymore, not charging per device. Air no, no, outdoor, a whole air conditioning unit. You just hook it up to your existing ventilation. You're not gonna put in a new ventilation. Oh, you're, gonna, you're gonna install it in, <clears throat> sorry. You're gonna install it into your existing system. However, there are provisions that the state uh, in the eyes of energy conservation are gonna require certain testing of that equipment um, that's done by a third party um, just to make sure that it is functioning properly and, and efficiently. So we're not going to be charged. So that'll be um, inspected by somebody else, and we don't. We won't be charging for that. Right, but they do report to me on that. I, I get a report on whether the system passes or fails. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so I, I see. We're we still on the the first page here. <laughs> I'm done. Kind with of gone in different uh, different uh, angles here, but um, are we ready to move on to page two? Okay, page two is um, specific plumbing and electrical fees. Um, so uh, I think you, you just talked about gray water systems, um, water heaters. Um, so. I'm, I'm, I'm actually want to encourage gray water systems. So I, I, I would say I would be happy to city to subsidize that to encourage people to use gray water and install gray water system. So, so is this for only for um, single family residents or is it for multifamily or commercial okay so i think that might be possibly a, a way to delineate for example you know with the tod one and two projects we have you know mandated a number of um, energy efficiency and water you know conservation measures and in those cases i don't know if i don't think we should be you know subsidizing something that we've mandated whereas i think it, it maybe could be different if it's you know a homeowner that wants to try to be more efficient and and, and green their home um, i think i would be open to having some type of i don't want to say a subsidy but a, a fee reduction in that case um, but not for larger they have a tier topics. system we have a tier system Yes, uh, Councilwoman Pappen. Um, at this point in time, I think that should be evaluated in the future as to how many of these systems are being sought after. I am not willing to make those kind of modifications at this point in time since we've lost like $800,000. <clears> we're trying to implement cost recovery here. So sometime in the future maybe, but um, again, I think there may be county programs and state programs which would benefit the consumer that we do not need to take up at this point. <clears throat> well, uh, sure, Count Councilman Lee, well, you, can, you, can, you can respond, go ahead. Well, let me just, I, I went to the Peninsula Clean Energy Retreat last Saturday where there was a discussion and it's, it's on one side they're still concentrating on giving rebates to people to buy an electric car, um, but there is $10 million set aside from Peninsula Clean Energy for resiliency actions, not defining the program yet as I understand it. So we really need to be very active with Peninsula Clean Energy and seeing is, it, is the money best spent to give a rebate for somebody who's already wealthy buying a Tesla or is it better spent trying to electrify an apartment building so that you can keep the apartment building as affordable housing. I think there's a number of things that we could be looking at, but PCE has that 10 million, and then they may have other programs that could help us with the resiliency of existing properties, which could fund, as, as Councilwoman Pappen said, there could be some monies that could rebate for a um, taking your water heater off of gas and putting it to electric. It, it's still... This is all still just happening right now, but I think we need to be very aggressive in keeping an eye on all of those funds. Okay. Potential funds. And, and there's the other question of ADUs. I mean, we're on the housing crisis, and we want to encourage housing, additional housing or additional living spaces, and ADUs is a, is a big part of that strategy. So 
you know, do we, what, how, I mean, how do we address that? Do we maybe just charge them like everybody else and say, here's, here's, here's a revenue, you know, or do we incentivize that? I, I mean, personally, I don't think the fee would be the, the determining factor of whether somebody builds an ADU or not, or whether somebody, you know, puts in a solar system or not. Um, you know, there's so many other costs, and an ADU, obviously the homeowner would get income from that, from renting out a unit. So um, I don't think that's... But you, but you only have, I mean, you can only rent out at certain market rates, and sometimes you cannot justify the Which talk. are quite high. Right? <laughs> Which is really high. Um, and it's high, but you still have other expenses, too. Like our sewer rates and our water rates have gone up higher. I mean, it's, you, you got you, you got to look at the whole big picture. Um, and I can say this because I'm actually paying those things myself. And it's not like I am one of those people who have a high tech job. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it impacts uh, people's ability to provide those things that we want in our city. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, Councilwoman Pepin. Yeah. Um, um, I wish we would stay on track here. I mean, if somebody is putting in solar, they're going to get the benefit of reducing their electrical bills. So there, there are all kinds of different aspects here. We are trying to focus, I believe, on cost recovery, and I think we should stay on that and try to get through these pages. No, yeah. Well, you have to, you just can't say just let's do cost recovery all the point. Of course, that's, that's so easy. Why don't we just charge a huge fee? Because we're not no, paying no, for wait, wait, it. We're not paying for it. The, you know the homeowner who's, who's doing the adjustment. I don't Let me finish. Okay. The, just, the person, the homeowner at home, who is, is going to pay for it? No big deal, right? They can pay for 100 percent. That's not a problem. Councilwoman, no. <laughs> wait. I'm, I don't think the idea here is to charge and make money on anything. I think it's called recovery. So let's stay focused on how we could be fiscally smart for the city of Millbrae. Well, let me also say that you, when you build a solar panel, you know it's a ten, maybe a 10-year investment. You might be lucky to to come out even. Yeah. And they, have, well, they also I, have, you know, ten years. solar leasing yes, programs. Mayor. They have ways to make it, Pace Lawns have ways to make it very affordable. Uh, Councilman Pepin? Yeah, I mean, at the beginning of this proposal, we're not here to make a profit. We are here to recover costs, as the initial speaker pointed out. And so I think we need to stay focused on that. And I, having just put in solar, I'm hoping the recovery is a lot sooner than that. Uh, but it, there is lots of benefits here. So I think we should get through this and stay focused on that. Okay. Um, shall we move to the next page? Or a mechanical? Yeah, solar, this page is mechanical and solar systems. Again, with solar, uh, many of those are determined by the state. Okay, so we can't change those, but, you know, as was mentioned, there are many financial incentives to uh, solar these days. Okay, move on. Where's, oh, okay. Okay. Um, these are some of the building miscellaneous fees, uh, certificate of occupancy, temporary occupancy, re-inspections, um, plan review, an hourly rate for staff, um, appeal of a building official decision, which would be a time and materials cost. Um, we currently have a technology fee and a documentation fee. We're proposing to merge those into a single fee uh, because we're using more technology for documentation, so just build a full system that handles both. Quick question. Uh, yes. Um, on those technology and documentation fees, are we included in there the um, maintenance of records? I don't know how many times, you know, nobody, we forgot where somebody put a pipe or something like that. Documentation is extremely um, important as to how we are record keeping. And that has been a problem throughout the city of Melbourne for decades. So is that included in this fee? Absolutely. The, the intention is to digitize many of the records, and the city clerk has started from their project already. They're, I don't know how far along they are, but they're, they're moving along. Thank you. Okay. Is that the... Um, yes, Councilman Lee. Is that also the appeal to the city council? I saw, I saw like $4,000 to appeal. That's on the planning fee? So we'll get to that. That's oh, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, never mind. Sorry. All right. We move to the next one. Okay. So the next are the uh, 
the fees based on project valuation. So again, there's a residential type based on family dwellings, ADUs, accessory buildings related to residential, and then a separate set of fees for um, commercial, including multifamily, residential, and industrial. Um, one item of note is that projects exceeding a million dollars, these these numbers are just used to calculate a deposit amount. They'll be charged at time and materials. For example, um, a project may need to be contracted out for a building inspector, um, and so we would we would then charge against a deposit that's collected. I'm sorry. Uh, are these? These are total uh, costs for review of, um, of these different projects. So there's a there's a permit fee, which is this project valuation based fee. There's an additional plan review fee, which is a seventy percent of that fee. I think there's a permit yeah, application fee or permit permit issuance fee, um, and then MEP in addition. Okay, so those are the three. Well, they, yeah, they would be. Okay. okay. Yes, Vice Mayor. I, I'm sorry, I think you passed this, but I don't know what an SB 1473 green fee is. I just need to know what it means. The state passed legislation to uh, gain money for the state to further their own green endeavors. Uh, so every building department charges that fee. Um, there's also another fee on here that is included that's not part of the building department fee is every business license that's issued is assessed a $1 fee that also goes to the state. And this is to further the state's ability to have funding for them, for the departments to, to go green uh, from simple things such as recycled copy paper to buying uh, electric vehicles for the departments. So that, that the SB 1473 is funding for that mechanism. Wow, so the city has to come up with the money to buy recycle copy paper, but the state the, gets us to buy their copy paper? The, the, build, the person applying for a building permit is the one being assessed that fee, yeah. That's a sweet deal. Hmm. Okay. So we have the um, various fees based on project valuation. Um, okay, so then... So any any other questions on on those? So there was valuation for basically residential type projects and then commercial and industrial type projects. Um, the department will be building a little bit more of a of a manual around you know what what each fee means, what's included, um, to assist as people are coming in to initiate a project. So the next um, section is the planning fees. Maybe. So, um, again, with planning fees, um, uh, we'll start with development applications. The um, maybe this one needs to be a little bit smaller. Elaine, Elaine. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I was getting, trying to get Elaine's attention. I'm sorry. Can you help me bring it? I need to make it smaller. Oh, we just... Do you want to cancel this? Or do you want to keep it? Okay. Thanks. Okay. So now we're on the planning fees, starting with development application fees, um, uh, plan, plan and permit extension and modification fees. Um, I don't know if you want to walk through these again or just take on specific questions about them. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. 
This has to do with the public hearing notification fee, the appeal of planning commission decisions to city council fee, and the legal notice. Um, the first time I read this, I wasn't sure who was, uh, who was subjected to those fees. So if I'm a, a homeowner and I come to the city with a remodel and planning commission doesn't go my way and I want to bring it to council, I pay the fees. But if I'm the neighbor next door who might be having something built that has been approved by planning commission, and will be affecting, could, in my view, affect the house. Am I also paying that fee? Yeah, you are. So that's why the, I think what um, uh, Councilmember Lee was talking about was the notion of whether or not there should be any level of subsidy as it relates to appeal, appeal fees. What we have here is full cost recovery, but, but you are correct. So this appeal, uh, fee would apply to either an applicant who doesn't like their decision or to an interested party who also doesn't like the decision. So uh, just using that one example of the house that wanted to raise their roof line up on Vallejo, um, that group that came out, they had to pay about $523 to bring it to us. That fee would jump to $4,547. As it's recommended here, yes. I cannot support that. More, more than that, it'd be over six thousand dollars, six to seven thousand yeah, dollars. Yes, Councilman Lee. Yeah, I, I think we should have a different tier for uh, people who wants to appeal against a project because we don't want this. We don't want to make it so prohibited that somebody can't voice their opinion because they can't afford to appeal the process. Um, so I, mean, I understand if, if the person really wants their addition, they, yeah, that's okay. You know, if they want really want it that bad, they can pay the seven thousand dollars in appeals. But if you're a neighbor, I mean, and and you're not happy with and your your neighborhood, then you got to go out and collect money from everybody to to try to dissuade. Or you should have so a person should have an opportunity to to appeal. Um, uh, a neighbor's project, they're not happy with it. Yes, uh, Councilman Pepin. Um, my question, both aspects of that, sometimes in filing legal actions, people who are successful get their money back. However, if I've got a neighbor who's just completely unreasonable and is going to object to absolutely everything without any um, skin in the game, that's problematic because uh, you will get people right and left, you know, I don't like the color you painted your house, so I'm taking it, I'm appealing it. You know, they, people have just been known on both sides, some reasonable, some unreasonable. So there has to be somewhere in the middle where people have consequences to uh, objecting, and if they are successful, I don't know how this works. I'm just saying right here. If they're successful, maybe they, their fee is refunded. But if they're just being obstructionists, I don't think that's beneficial. To yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but I don't. I, I don't think we should uh, dissuade legitimate. You know, they, we're really dissuading. I mean, seven thousand dollars. I mean, that's what it's going to cost because you have to pay for the the, the hearing notification fee, the um, the appeal itself and the legal notice. So that's over $7,000. I don't know anybody who has $7,000 who's a retired person and doesn't like the fact that they have a window looking straight into their bedroom window, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I'm just saying it should, there should be a different level. Uh, and even if they can cost recover, where do you can find the $7,000 to, to put in? But may, may I ask for clarification? Do, you, do they not have an opportunity to appear at a planning commission meeting or something? I, I'm not sure how this process would work, but I would assume for free they could come to the planning commission meeting or submit a letter to the planning commission objecting to any sort of project. Right. Uh, Councilman Oliva? I would agree that that's what I wanted to say um, in the debate on my right and my left here, but there's a process in place, so this would be after the fact. This is this is somebody that is not happy with the decision of a process right. that already to part, that already took part. Went through the process, right? Yeah. It's already gone through the process. So, right. so if it's it, it would be somebody that was just angry at the idea. Their neighbor, yeah. Not a window that's looking into their 
living room. Uh, so, Ms. Mayor, I, I'm sorry, I think there's two processes here. Some remodeling plans or new construction, I don't think new construction, but remodeling plans get handled entirely by staff. It's under 500 feet. Um, it doesn't trigger a number of things. Suddenly you find out, because this happened to my parents, um, the city didn't recognize that we lived on a hill and the house behind us suddenly added another 10 feet to their house. Well, the planner at that time felt that we had no view and when that house was built uh, when my family tried to fight it I didn't live here at the time but when they fought it they lost and we lost our view of the bay now we don't have a view shed ordinance view shed ordinances are difficult to get but that would have meant that my parents who basically lived paycheck to paycheck would have to come up with seventy five hundred dollars for something that did not go to a planning commission meeting now maybe with our notification as I just learned over the Christmas break the the notification for remodel is one house next to one house across the street possibly one house catty corner but given the strange way of our lot sometimes you're you're within that view shed or you're within that drainage shed but you're not noticed so you don't even know that this is happening until suddenly a wall goes up next to you that takes away everything that you bought the house for originally so I, I, I think and then there's the process that goes through planning if we think of that house on Lamita a couple of years ago the neighbor brought their side and they lost. The new house went in, it took away some of their son, that was the way it is. We have other examples where, because we have no architectural design guidelines by neighborhood, people are putting in things that absolutely do not blend with the neighborhood. There's one up in Meadows that's horrible, and it'll be there forever. And that was done, I don't know how that one was done, it's so wrong. It has two front doors, it's just so wrong. Um, there has to be a way that you can be a, a, have your rights and not have to come up with $7,500. My parents would have had to have taken out an equity loan to come up with that $7,500. And that I just don't think that's right. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. It's, it is, uh, I think, too high for, um, I think if it's if it's a neighbor objecting and doesn't really have much of a say, if it's, I kind of agree with Councilman Lee that if it's the, the homeowner, they could perhaps pay a little bit more um, than the neighbor can because they're the ones getting the benefit um, f from that uh, property uh, addition to the property. But I think in my you know six years on the council, I think there have maybe been three appeals uh, of a planning commission decision that was denied. So this is not you know something that we're doing all the time. Um, I think if if I don't think cost recovery is that crucial in this situation just because it's a very rare occurrence. If it's something that starts happening, you know, every week, uh, <laughs> I think we, we certainly can, can increase uh, the fees. But, um, you know, I, I think maybe, you know, a modest increase from what it is now just because uh, it probably hasn't been changed in several years, um, I, I would be able to support. But uh, this level of cost recovery, I think, is, is too high. And, and it, it, I think it, it de-democratizes kind of our, our planning process. Yeah, Mayor, I, I was just going to, to say, um, Mayor and Council, is, is this is a dilemma that every council faces when they have this fee. And so my experience has been that for the applicant to appeal a decision, you know, as, as you're discussing, then the cost recovery is implemented. Uh, for somebody that is not the applicant, you know, surrounding neighbor or property owner, it's 50% of, of the fee. So as I think Council Member Pappen had said, you don't want to incentivize somebody to appeal everything without some skin in the game and so I would advise not to you know lower the fee significantly to kind of open the floodgates when people find out hey it doesn't cost me anything to 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 appeal it but they do have some you know reason for it and there's interest and um, you know vested interest in that appeal decision so it should be our recommendation is something but it could be a lot of cities go 50 percent uh, for the um, non applicant to appeal I think even 50%, that would be, you know, about 30, 30 32,000. Yeah, closer to, close to $4,000. That's still, that seems like a lot for, you know, um, cause, because if, if they don't appeal it, then it's done at that point. And 
Um, I, I don't know if there's a method for, you know, I, I think there have been a couple times where council members have brought things up that, from the Planning Commission. So, you know, potentially they could lobby their, the, uh, one of us to, to bring something up from the Planning Commission. But, um, you know, that, that kind of goes around this whole process. The current fee is 1279 right now. Okay, you, correct. Um, and I think, you know, the, the fee being what it is and the fact that we rarely get these appeals, um, I don't think we're encouraging anybody to go ahead and just, you know, deny, uh, deny, deny. deny. Um, Councilman Pepin? Um, to the concern of the council members as far as um, financial strain on someone, I do think maybe we want to drop a footnote that somebody could speak before the council to bring something up like that to bring it to our attention as the mayor pointed out these are very rare but if someone feels strong and they're on a limited income um, maybe we could implement something where you could that could be presented to the council and the council could decide whether they would like that brought forth just a suggestion That'd be the same thing as going through. That's hard. I think there would be a due process issue, but we, we could do a time and materials up to a certain cap also for the uh, non-applicant. So start out at, you know, the fee will be a, a time and materials based on the complexity of the appeal up to a cap. And um, I mean, that is at the discretion of the city council in terms of what would that cap be? You know, 10% of the fee 25% of the fee. Um, I, I would just caution, you know, again, what, what Council Member Pappin said, is there, you, there's, there should be some incentive for somebody to appeal something so we don't get, you know, all these appeals just because somebody doesn't like, you know, the color or something like that. So that, that's the only caution I'm saying. So it should be something. Um, I, I'm not just saying nothing. I'm just saying yeah. we should, yeah, we can increase. And if we, we say, you know, say 25% time and materials and the cap would be 25% or 30, you know, a third of the fee or something like that. Um, I think 25% is. Now we can also, you know, look at these and as I've communicated to the council, you know, any decision that's made, if we find that there's a fatal flaw or something that's a discrepancy, we'll, we'll bring that back to the city council for consideration adjustments. You know, so that we can move forward and see how things work, and if there needs to be adjustments, we can, we'll bring it back. Well, the notification fee currently is at about 25%. The legal notice is a little bit below, uh, close to actually close to 25% as well. Um, so uh, really the only one that, that isn't is the appeal decision. That's well below that amount. I'm, I'm sorry, what are you getting that? Oh, I, I'm just... just Doing quick mental math of the oh, which part <coughs> the, the comparing the current fee to the cost of service of the, those three items. Twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. Oh no, it's more. <laughs> it's triple. Um, anyway, of uh, I mean quadruple. Anyway, um, it's um, I I think uh, twenty five percent is about fourteen fifteen hundred dollars. Um, I would go. I can go for that. <laughs> I think that's I think that's a reasonable barrier, but yet it's uh, not prohibitive. Yeah, I think that is appropriate, and and again, it's it's you know, hopefully, if there's an appeal, if there's something that's worthy of an appeal, there would be multiple neighbors that think it's worthy, not just one neighbor. So they'd be able to pool resources together to to share our cost if they all agree that. They don't want a, a project to happen. Um, so you, you recommend a 25 percent for those three, four. Uh, up to up to 25 percent. Up, up to 25 percent for a non um, not uh, full 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 cost recovery for the applicant and for another somebody else appealing. 25 percent. 25 percent. Up to 25% of the proposed um, uh, full, cost. Uh, full cost, yeah. Including legal notices and everything. Yes, yes. So up to 25% of each fee. 
between 25 percent and 80 uh, It would include the public notice, it would public hearing notice, it would include the appeal to the city council and the legal notice for the planning commission appeal. Well, the, um, let's see, the notification fee is currently 27%, so maybe we can just leave that one as it is, otherwise it would be a, a reduction. <laughs> So this creates a cap of $1,907, using a 25% of each fee except for the public hearing notification fee, which you have recommended. Just leave it at 373, yeah. So we'll um, deal within the resolution, but I just wanna be sure that that's what we're looking at. We're on the same page. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on this page or can we move on to the next one? Okay, let's move on. Okay. Um, next is um, environmental determinations, conditional use permits, exceptions, variances. Um, again, uh, calculating from um, cost of service and um, recommending full cost recovery in, in these cases. I have no problem with that. Okay. So move right along to the next one. So next is design review. Um, again, similar set of recommendations. Um, oh yes, uh, Councilman, uh, let's go with Councilman Pappen. A uh, question if we do, and I hope we do, get a design review um, going here, where would that fit in? Once we bring that ordinance and policy to the council, then we would add that design review fee, and it probably would not be a fixed fee, it would be a deposit uh, for that process. Hopefully we can get one quickly, thank you. I have a question for all other new construction. So that would be, you know, new housing tracks, commercial or, you know, large multifamily, something like that, maybe. Yes. Um, I, yeah, I would, would it make sense to maybe have that on a square footage uh, calculation? Right, so at the, at the end of the um, fee uh, sheet, what you'll notice is there is a new category for what we're calling large projects, which are projects that are greater than um, 50,000 square feet and or 50 units. So really what this would be capturing is sort of that, that in-between universe of commercial or larger or housing projects on a design review fee at the $9,000 mark. And then if it goes over, then it would be a deposit-based um, fee. Okay, yeah, I was just thinking about our TOD one and two and how much time we spent on those design reviews. I think much more than $9,000 for, for each of those. Um, let's see, Councilman Lee? Uh, ugh, sorry, um, so our, these fees are for 100% cost recovery for staff review, right? Okay, um, uh, I'm just skipping ahead real quick, but you also have this um, hourly rate so I, you can, I guess you can explain that to me later, right? So uh, it's something totally different. All right. Yeah, that's typically those, um, for example, those large projects. So if staff's working on it versus contracting it out, so sometimes we'll contract that to mm. an environmental consultant. Or if staff works on it instead, we want to be able to charge their hourly time um, to the project. And, and those are for deposit accounts. Yes, for okay, so you're, you're talking, okay, so now I'm learning that these fees are what the contractors are charging us? These are our own staff fees. Okay, so you, what you just said is that sometimes 
we contract out for certain projects. On those deposit-based large projects that, that Brad just mentioned, uh -huh. you, we may contract some of that out and then we char direct charge that out to the applicant. Okay. So something like the TOD projects that we're working on today. Okay, but that's not here. So. That's not what these... Okay, so that's what confused me. I don't, I don't want... These are typically done by staff. Okay, good. Um, but occasionally staff will work on a large project and we wanted to be sure to have a fully loaded rate to recover their time. Right. Um, onto a large deposit project. Right. Okay. Um, well, so my question here is, so if it's staff review, like a small 500 square feet, I understand that. Um, you're, you're asking for it's $4,500. Um, let's say you're doing a, a bigger than that, right? So are we charging the staff review and the planning commission review, or is that a, a different type of fee? Right. So it's th so all of this is sort of threshold driven, right? So, um, for instance, down in kind of the middle part of this, where it says single family edition PC review versus single family edition staff review, that's a threshold question. If you have a single story edition that's you know basically less than 500 square feet, that's a, a level at the staff. That's the 4,500 dollars. The next level up, two story edition, more than 500. Okay. Square well, feet. not adding, so it's not yeah. all together. Right. No, they're, they're, they're I all want separate. to clarify that. Make sure. That it's not on top of each. That's right. For different okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider, do you have a comment or question? Um, if I'm on the right page, if I'm on the right page, the temporary special event permit. So from two hundred and fifty-one dollars to fifteen hundred and ninety-two dollars. Didn't we go through a form where everybody applying for special events has to basically put all the information on a form? And in which case, really, fifteen hundred and ninety-two dollars? Or am I? What kind of special events are we talking about here? What, what I believe is the vision here is if someone were trying to do like a private event, not maybe not like a community-based event, but a, uh, like a special event uh, that maybe is a one-day um, private party or something of that nature. So maybe there's going to be a caterer and there's going to be a large gathering in a building and they're going to be in the outdoors, say like an office party, that, that might be something that we would grant a one-day special temporary use permit for. Okay, because like most of the special event ones, we tend to eat those costs per correct. when they come to us to get their permit anyway. Right, and I think those sort of fall into a different category. This is if this is if it were a sort of a land use request on private property. Right, private pri party. Like for instance, uh, okay, so if we had big backyards and somebody was having a wedding, because my neighbor had a wedding in her backyard, but she simply came and knocked on all of our doors and asked if it was okay. Right, so we would refine our messaging to the public on that, that in the event that the special use permit is required, then you would have this planning review fee to look at. Okay. Where's parking going to be, and how's catering going to occur, and noise, and hours of operation? Wow. So it was her brother's second or third marriage. It was family of 20 people. We're going to charge $1,500? Especially on a third marriage. In theory, we, that's, that's what is, is your brief. I just think sometimes be careful what we're getting ourselves into. I mean, I could see if this was, you know, one of the billionaires who are... Larry Ellison is throwing a party in his backyard because I've been to one of those. You know, I can tell you that that's quite a thing. That's quite a thing. And but, I think a private house but, party is something a little bit different than that. Different than that. Okay. A gathering of friends okay. is different than that. I think it fits in that. I think it rises to the level of being an event, the level of being that may have neighborhood, may have impacts. That's where we're going to try that. That's where we're going to try to set that threshold. I'd love to see this one come back to us after we've had a few experiments. We've had a few experiments. And hopefully, we can, and hopefully we can get the uh, get the uh, process the paperwork, we can process the paperwork quickly, quickly and efficiently enough that it doesn't actually cost us fifteen hundred dollars, um, especially for these you know recurring community events where we end up uh, you know giving yeah exactly. Okay, let's go to the next page. Next page is um, wireless communications. Um, This is commercial, non commercial area. Yes, this is commercial, non commercial area. Yeah, page numbering helps people. Yeah, page numbering. Yeah. I actually have a question on this one. Are there, uh, I keep hearing about state laws coming up and FCC rulings that limit the ability to charge fees on wireless antennas and things like that? 
There are terms. some specifics around design and as well as what we can charge in terms of a lease if they use. Okay, a lease. Okay, that's what those um, were for. Okay. I've not seen anything on, for example, the entitlement. Okay. Here's my dumb question. And okay. So with the 5G systems going up and with many residents being concerned about electromagnetic radiation, how would they be charged if they wanted to file an appeal? I think this is out of our hands, isn't it? Most of the 5G activity or 4G or any of it is, we don't have a say. So they won't be able to appeal that decision because that's federal law under FCC. So this, this would only pertain to the aesthetics? Okay. Of the installation, not the right, not the right to not the right not the right, right to do it. But all. should they make it look like a fake tree versus this right. big thing right. hanging off somebody's bedroom window right. or um, scenic or, window? Time, place, and manner. Or, or if somebody decides to rent their roof out to a to a uh, <laughs> private cell right. company, they would need a permit, and that would be the process. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next one. We don't know. Right. Okay, and then a set of miscellaneous fees. We touched on these a little bit earlier, hourly rate for staff review. These are, again, things that are outside of those first page projects that are that are more fixed in cost, but for those threshold projects that, for example, end up in a deposit. Um, we've also included engineering staff hourly rate for those um, for those projects, for, for example, we talked, we, we use the TODs as an example, as a common example. There are some other projects in a deposit base. Um, status and the second uh, second area is just it's not the total fee it's the recommended initial deposit and then as that deposit is used um, or if we issue contracts to outside consultants we would increase the deposit correspondingly okay oh yes vice mayor sorry mine kind of goes backwards it's the the fees for signage. We spent a great deal of time on signage for the two TODs, and I know we're in the process of looking at a business improvement district or a community improvement district, whatever we're calling it. Um, signage. Some of our stores have signage that we've mandated in the TODs, but then they also put signage everywhere else. Where does all that everywhere else? And, and I say that probably because I'm liaison to the Community Enhancement Committee, and for years their biggest bugaboo downtown were all of the signs that get glued to the windows. So if we make signage too onerous to go through, are we leading people to putting things stuck to the glass windows? Yeah, I think, um, Council Member, that's a different issue. We okay. already have a, an ordinance that does not allow that, so it's really a code enforcement issue more than it is a planning, design, and, and building fee Okay, issue. and if we do get the BID approved, would any f signage fees fall underneath that? No. It would still come this program. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, any others on this page? Okay, let's go on to the next one. So the last one is um, the single fee in the finance department. Um, at your last hearing, you adopted a alarm permit fee. That's, for example, for an alarm through a private company. If your alarm goes off, it rings that private company. They will call dispatch if needed. This alarm monitoring fee are for alarms that go directly to county dispatch. And, and they dispatch from there. Um, there's some equipment that, that the city would contribute to, and there's a cost um, to um, county communications for their services as well as city, city time in that. So um, those users that have that fee have a lower, ha, receive a couple of false alarms at no cost versus uh, users that have the, just a basic permit. So we just worked with the with the county on their rates using the same methodology, but we worked on that at staff level to establish that fee. And for no, th this would be an annual fee up for this particular item. The other ones are a one-time fee. This would be an annual fee. Correct. Okay. Um, so we have discussed a, a number of uh, things here. I think we had consensus regarding the appeal um, fees for planning commission decisions. And um, there was some discussion earlier at the beginning about um, you know, various uh, home improvements for energy and water efficiency, things like that. Um, what's the direction of the council on, on that issue? 
I, I don't know if we really resolved that. So we will provide footnotes on our fee on our adopted fee schedule, um, and tie that into um, links and information for reimbursement programs, both through PCE, the state, and federal. That, that was that was one of the things that was the direction. Yes, so, Vice Mayor Schneider. Um, Years ago, the Sierra Club did a survey of solar permit fees in the three counties that the Loma Prieta chapter does, and they found at the time that Millbrae had the highest solar permit fees. What happened then is Millbrae, like, and what they did is they peer pressured all cities across the three counties, and most of them dropped it to zero. I can't remember if Millbrae went to zero. It did stimulate solar activity. Um, I understand now that the state mandated it's $500 everywhere. So that, that argument's out. I guess I would like to say for any of these things that, that could be in some way be a climate change resiliency fee, that we come back and look at them and see if they are annually or every two years, are they preventing certain beneficial behaviors from happening? The one that I think I'm thinking most of, but maybe there'll be PCE money for that, is when you're an apartment manager putting in um, EV charging stations in apartments are one of the reasons it prevents apartment dwellers from being able to get an electric car. But that's expensive. And now the apartment owner can always raise the rents to cover it, but then that becomes an affordable housing issue. So if we can just have a mechanism to come back and look at these and see if they're causing problems, see how well the rebate programs come back, and we put it on the calendar and we know we come back in a year or two and look at it. Yeah, I think that's a, a good suggestion. Um, Councilman Lee? Uh, you know, I, I really think that we shouldn't even charge for gray water system. I want to encourage people to put gray water systems in, um, especially with, you know, our drought issue situation. I, you know, it's kind of like, insult, it's, just, it's just adding insult to injury. The, um, Councilwoman Pepin? Um, I think a lot of research and background went into all these fees. And again, the primary goal here is cost recovery and only cost recovery. I think it's important that we leave them as they are right now. As far as solar and all of that, especially in apartment buildings, they are definitely giving rebates and the county is encouraging um, buildings to put them in. So those those aspects are already out there. Should they be removed at a later date, then I think we can readdress these issues. I did have one question on, we've had issues in the past regarding people making improvements and then all of a sudden an inspector shows up and says, oh, hey, you need sprinklers. Um, I just wonder where we are on things like that. Surprise, um, here's your application and you need more money, or as a resident happened recently, uh, they were told to increase their sewer line uh, unjustly due to a contractor that we hired, and then because they didn't realize that or they were told that after the fact, they were charged another $5,000 by the city of Millbrae because the trench was left open for a period of time. So things like this, where you take out an original permit and then all of a sudden you're told something else and the city tax on fees, I have extreme problems with. So the sprinkler issue, I, I didn't see anything here on sprinklers, so maybe that law has changed. But in the past, we have had homeowners who did improvements and some inspectors showed up and said, you need sprinklers. So if that's no longer an issue, I'm very glad to hear that because I don't see it in here. Uh, but there, these are fire. So fire fees? Yeah, specific to the, to the sprinklers and the fire fees, it, that's um, because you guys contract for fire services. Those fees are set by... That, that fire agency. Yeah. So that's Which not a adopt. fee that you set and or adopt. It's a, it's a separate fee from a separate entity. So, But it is a city we, fee. We do adopt it as a fee, but it's set by... But it's set by a different agent. It's much like the county fees or state fees where oh, technically don't have you're, you're adopting it, but it's, mm -hmm. it's being imposed by somebody else. Okay. Specific I, to the sprinkler one. And I think the message here is not necessarily the fee. It is being able to have the plan check and 
standard of care to where that error is not made. That's right. And that, that's a different issue. That's more of a quality control. The homeowner's not surprised at some late date about a requirement of that nature. That should be part of the planning process up front. I yeah, would, that's an error on, on yes, not the fee, so. but on the... Um, is there a fee in here for, we've heard... I don't know if you call them horror stories of great surprises where somebody came in to remodel a bathroom and they got all the permits and stuff and then the inspector went out and there's just one wall left of the house and an abuse was obviously occurring. So what kind of fees do we have for that? Right. So if, if you recall when we did the building code update earlier this year, one of the new um, provisions was to allow, to have the authority to fine folks if they go above and beyond the scope of the work that's in their permit and we do have the ability to do a one two three type of you know shame on you one shame on you twice all the way up to 10 times the building permit fee so we do have that stick if you will uh, for when those uh, types of projects are occurring um, is that recovering your costs? Because that's my only goal here, is that I need to know that besides the fact they've offended us greatly. Sure. No, no. So, so first there would, be the, there would be the fee for going above and beyond the scope of work. Next we would say, now you need to come in with a set of plans that truly recognize what that scope of work is, and then, then they're going to pay these fees here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, I, and I, if I may, may um, Anybody that's listening that's a licensed contractor or architect, we we are seriously reporting licensed contractors to the state board. We've reported three contractors this year wow. that have done just that to the state board. So I think it's important that we provide great service. We get people in and out. We avoid errors. But on those times when people do take advantage and violate that we, we, we mean business now in the city of Melbourne. Uh, That's what I'm leave it. Oh. A follow up on that. Sure. So is this on our website? Because the homeowner doesn't know that until like a contractor screws them over. Do we have something on our website that says, if you feel you've been ripped off or something, um, contact we, we do not, but let me work with um, planning and, and our chief building official to get some public announcements out on our website That'd that be great. would help. Thank yeah. Uh, Councilman Oliva? I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilman Lee? Um, are, are, uh, is there any speakers? There are no speakers on this item. Uh, okay, I, I'll make my comment later. Mr. Mayor, sir. Just a couple of things. Um, we haven't adopted reach codes yet. Should we adopt reach codes, do we have to make any modifications to any of these fees? You want to define that, please? I could attempt to. Reach codes in a simple form are to electrify buildings to reduce the use of natural gas. Really simplified version. Right. Yeah. So there's still that process is ongoing. The county has been very active in trying to get municipalities throughout San Mateo County to adapt reach codes. Um, we have some analysis that has suggested that some of the codes um, are, are even more reaching than what we initially thought they were. So staff is still doing some analysis on those with the anticipation of bringing those back before council for your consideration in the, in the near term. Okay, so there'd be adjustments then if there had to be at that. If needed, yes. Then just to kind of clarify with Councilwoman Pappen talking about existing programs at the Peninsula Clean Energy Strategic Retreat, they went over the existing programs and the pilot projects. The pilot, the, there are no set projects that I'm aware of that give a apartment or condominium owner, well, it would be a, an apartment owner, um, a rebate for installing EV charging stations. There's a pilot for it. There's a pilot where that entity got 75000 to test things out. But um, those programs don't exist yet, so we have to be careful with that. And my last thing, if we had a climate action plan and it looked at um, teardowns of house, housing versus rebuilding from scratch, we're going to get into the concept of embodied energy. Every building material has a s number of energy inputs into it which have a greenhouse gas effect. And when you do a monster house teardown, we should be charging more for that. Frankly, if we wanted a fee for teardowns as opposed to remodels, there's a lot of energy in, in our existing structure that we need to recognize on top of the zero waste aspects of it. So I'd be happy for you to come back with a fee on teardowns. 
if you look at what's happened in Hillsborough, where one house has been torn down three times, it's going into its third time, and these, it, it just breaks my heart, the amount of resources that went into those. Okay, um, um, Councilman Lee. Is there, is there a, uh, is there some sort of um, uh, um, way of providing financial assistance to like a senior who needs to remodel her kitchen because it got flooded or something um, without having to charge them like, you know. Hopefully they'd have insurance, right? They'll cover it. <laughs> they cover the permit. Can I tell you what happened to us when our kitchen flooded? Um, we didn't have to pay a complete remodeling fee. We paid inspection fees but not remodeling. So I thought it was very fair because the insurance did not cover everything because the cabinets were 29 years old. So they don't, they do not make you whole. Right. I, I realize that and that's why I'm saying it. And if you're on a fixed income, you know, it can mean the difference of having a kitchen and not having a kitchen. The insurance will cover the, the No, the kids can, can, in an ideal world, the insurance will cover everything, but it doesn't. It's like a work center. You still have to pay a deposit, you st I mean, uh, you know, deductible. a deductible, and you still have to pay for the inspection fees. So are you recommending that we have like a, like a low income yes. program or something? That yes. Do other cities have, let's look at Landing Lane that for years flooded every year. So those people had to replace stuff every year. If it included a bathroom, I, I think the permit fees are, it's not a brand new remodel. I, I don't know, Wayne, that's an interesting concept. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what the city. Or a FEMA, but you have to be a large enough flood, which is part of the problem with Landing Lane. They're not large enough. They're not enough homes for it to always qualify as a FEMA disaster, although it did a couple of years ago. Former city manager Reigns did make it a FEMA project. I mean, if, if your water faucet by pipes break and, you know, that's just, or your roof leaks and ruins, you know. It's we're, just, talking, uh, we're talking... A flood in a kitchen to the flood of an area. So I'm just saying. Well, I'm just it, trying it, to, what I'm saying is, it doesn't have to be some major thing to cause a problem that uh, it, it wipes out your kitchen. It could be a small FEMA thing. A no, no, I'm not talking about FEMA. I'm just talking about, you know, just the fact that somebody who low income has to replace their kitchen, order whatever, and they and they can't afford a lot of the fees. I mean, I would I would ask maybe our our consultants if that's something that other cities often do. <laughs> from your experience? <laughs> it, it's not something that you would typically see on a fee schedule. I mean, I think um, you always, as a, as a resident in most places, you always have the option to petition a council for a fee waiver, generally speaking. And you could always put that in, in place that someone has the ability to do that, come state their case to, to council. I think um, a lot, if you're talking about uh, floods and fires, whether they rise to the FEMA level or not, um, a lot of times insurance assuming that you have it, um, will pay for not only the materials to rebuild, but the fees associated with the permits required for that. Um, I think to the level, though, that you're speaking about is more about kind of helping out um, uh, lower income families. And that is, I think, that's a policy discussion and a policy decision. And it would be something where the council maybe might say, we're going to set aside X number of dollars a year or something like that. And that you then let the community know that you could come and petition um, to, to use some of those dollars to offset fees. Um, that's something that has happened. It's not, it's not very common. Um, uh, certainly not here in the Bay Area, um, but not uh, in other jurisdictions in Southern California and the Central Valley uh, that I have seen. But again, it's not, it's not that it isn't done. Uh, if you wanted to do it, you could do it because again, it'd be a policy decision and you wouldn't be, you'd be reducing a fee as a, you know, so as long as you're not charging more than, you can make those kinds of policy decisions. Yes. And let me mention that a lot of agencies, including ourselves, have made that distinction at times. We always say, oh, let's look at somebody who has low income based on, you know, PG needs determination or whatever AT and T determination that they qualify to have, you know, a certain break on certain things or certain fees or um, I would just ask our finance department if this has been an issue that's come up with, you know, homeowners that have had trouble paying the fees and 
what generally happens if that's the case. Um, specific to building fees, I don't know of any. Um, now there's community development, so they typically come to us to pay um, our fees that have not been changed since 2013, so they're much lower, I can assure you, than what they've paid in Burlingame or Hillsboro, and it's often the contractor, not the homeowner. Um, so yeah, we have not we have not received that. Um, again, it's something we can monitor um, and and come back. Um, and, and I'll tell you what's going to happen is that those people are just going to do it without under the table. They won't tell you about it. They won't come with permits, and they won't pay a fee. I think I would I would recommend you know maintaining the fees as recommended and if and, and monitoring the situation and if this is something that we see occurring we can look into uh, um, you know a low income program using maybe the PG&E um, uh, care program whatever whatever it's called um, but probably not at at this time I, w I would say. Uh, I, I would support that. My question is, I, I'm trying to think of people who have worked in our home and then they would tell me stories. They're renting an apartment or they're renting a house and I, the kitchen flooded and the landlord left it with a big hole in the kitchen for months. I wonder if some of this is landlords who don't get around to doing something. I'm not sure the fees or anything. It's just their way of running a business. But would, could we or do we ever hear from any of our people who are renters and having problems living in a substandard living condition? I think that's a different uh, discussion, I think. Okay. I just, I, I mean, maybe we need to start collecting that data so that we know if it's anything more than anecdotal. Hey, All right. I'm um, going to close the public hearing. Yes, let's close the public hearing. We have a motion from Vice Mayor Schneider and a second from Councilman Lee. Uh, your votes, please. The motion to close the public hearing passed unanimously. Okay. Um, let me clear the board. Okay, um, and we have a motion from Councilman Pappen to uh, accept the if fee. If I may, I wanted to just note that this resolution um, does include an automatic escalator with each fiscal year using um, okay. using CPI. The other one was written a little bit differently. We may have to bring that back, but it won't require a, another hearing and approval. I like the automatic Perfect. escalator. Are the escalators gotta always have, running? Got to have that. <laughs> <laughs> or else we'll eventually forget about these fees. Uh, sorry, Vice Mayor. Uh, of everything that we talked about tonight, the one thing that I didn't hear a plan or a resolution was the fee for a bathroom when it's a full bathroom versus a half bath because there is a difference in the amount of plumbing on there. There could be other projects that are in the same thing. How do we, I just don't think it's fair somebody coming in to put in a new toilet for a half bathroom is paying the full fee. Can we get a change in the motion? Can we get, can people, are you guys okay with the, uh, I, okay I don't, with I don't, how would staff remedy that? Uh, so you're talking about uh, the plumbing fees? The, the bathroom remodel fee? That's the first one. That, that's the one example that I could see in there that seems unequitable. Inequitable. So, so are you envisioning a scenario where perhaps like a toilet or something like that is just changed out? Well, I don't, I don't think that requires then a, right. a permit fee. That's just the plumbing fee, which if you go down for, on a per fixture basis. Well, then let me, what if it's, I'm going to put so in a, a bathroom as opposed to remodeling an entire bathroom? If you put in a half, that is a, that we would consider that a remodel. You could, you could have a half bath that's, you know, 500 square feet, for example, because a half bath is defined as not having a a um, shower or a tub. I just think in the world that I and live it, and it could bathrooms be, are usually a closet. Um, but they could be 500 square feet where a full bath could be, you know, 150 square feet with a, with a tub and a shower and a sink. And That's the only one that I'm, I am. So I think we go, I think in, in this case, I think that you were interested in was, let, let's say that I'm, you know, my, my shower pan is, is, is damaged. That, that's going to be a fixture fee, not a remodel fee. No, my difference was in terms of the number of inspections, you have to have more inspections if you're redoing your shower or bathtub because of the waterproofing than you do with a half bathroom where you're not dealing with waterproofing. You're not dealing with green board. You're not dealing with, with those kinds of things. So there's just fewer inspections with that. Therefore, to me, the cost recovery would be less. 
I think what we could look at is um, defining in the fee schedule, for example, using that per device fee if it's lower. So there's I'd the be per happy device, the that. permit issuance fee. So we can clarify that through the, um, so for example, if it's a half bath, it's a tub and a sink. Um, Mike left, okay. so I, I don't have all the answers. But we can we can look at the more appropriate way to charge if it's not a full bathroom. So I, I the, there's a replacement that we don't charge that, you know, replacement of fixtures and that type of thing that we don't charge the fee for the remodel. We just charge the per fixture fee versus a, an addition or a remodel. So we can, I, I think it's fair actually because we don't, you know, if it's a, if it's a shower pan or something like that, it's. 10 minutes more, you know, on the inspection. The oh, thing is, is it's a whole additional trip. Reviewing, yeah, correct the trips and, and there are a lot of fixed know, costs so. though, right? Just in terms of uh, permit review, whether. Yeah. There's a whole extra water. I had it done. So yeah. when you have to, when you do that, the inspector comes back and spends at least another half an hour or an hour when I had it done. So that's considerable more time than if you're just doing a half bathroom. And, and, I, and I will say just, you know, to be fair to the city, it depends on the quality of the contractor also. So it, it, no matter how minor or how major, it kind of depends on the quality of work. But we'll, we'll, we'll look at the equity issue on that and, and do a little bit more research and find out. Okay, so we have a, yes, we have a motion by Councilwoman Pappen and a second from Councilman Oliva. Oh, Councilman Lee. Yeah, I just wanted to state that I'm not going to be supporting this, not because I don't think we got to 100%. I mean, Tosca, I agree that uh, the work that Councilman Pappen, uh, she makes a strong case for it, but I just feel that there are certain things we should give uh, opportunities to incentivize ADUs, and also I want to say that some, I think that we should give an opportunity to, to help those people in need. Um, so I don't think we're doing that. Uh, but most 80%, 85% of those people who are who are doing re uh, modeling, I don't have a problem with 100% cost recovery. Okay. You have your votes, please. Item number 10 passed with a vote of four to zero with council member Lee dissenting. Four to one. Four to one. Sorry. Yeah. I'm it, zero. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so to be clear, we're adopting the resolution with Exhibit A and adding new appeal fees for the non-applicant. That will be um, the 25 percent, except for the one fee that will not, will change, stay the same. Okay. Thank you. And can we emphasize for the record how much money we've lost in the past? It was eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. Eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. Thank you. Okay, um, next on our agenda, we have existing business item number 11. This is the informational report on the draft final classification and compensation study, as well as resolution approving the revised salary schedule for maintenance worker classifications, effective December 29th, 2019. And we have our uh, administrative services director, Angela Lewis. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This evening I will be um, doing a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation on the classification and compensation study that was completed uh, by CPSHR, our firm that was retained to do the comprehensive study. And after that, um, I will be um, going into the second part of my report, which is to adopt a resolution to approve um, revised salary schedules effective December 29th of 2019, which includes a 5% equity increase to the job classification in the maintenance worker series. So with that, I will begin the um, PowerPoint presentation. Let's see here. Okay. So we'll be going over a brief um, overview of the methodology for the classification and compensation pieces of the study. Oh, sorry. I should get closer. Great. So I'll be doing a brief um, overview of both the classification and compensation methodology, and then just doing a, uh, an overview of the compensation data in the study as well. So CPSHR um, was 
retained to uh, do both the class and comp study and the classification uh, spec uh, study was to review the data and re um, review the duties and responsibilities of each of the positions that we um, have in the city recommend a classification structure uh, make uh, um, develop or recommend class specifications do an FLSA um, designation evaluation and then recommend the allocation of positions to newer revised classifications so overall the study encompassed 80 full-time positions and 46 part-time positions allocated to 90 classifications the next part of the study was for the um, compensation portion and for that the um, we looked at 15 agencies in our area and we looked at a total of 30 benchmark classifications so the in developing the cities that we looked at we did work with um, the Teamsters they were part of the study and we uh, came up with the cities of uh, Burlingame, Belmont, Foster City, Half Moon Bay, Pinole, San Bruno, San Carlos, San Mateo, South San Francisco, and then um, East Bay Municipal uh, Utilities District, the Estero Municipal Improvement District, and the San Francisco International Airport. So we were looking again for um, agencies that were similar in size, similar in scope, geographic proximity, and agencies where some of our former employees may have gone to. And in some instances, we do have some specialized job classifications because we have our own treatment plant, so we did need to look at different agencies so that we could um, get a complete picture in our survey. So the benchmark classifications are listed here. We did a total of 30 benchmark classifications, and there is a mixture of the different classifications that we looked at. They were in either the entry level, the journey level, supervisory level, management, and department head level. So we had a good mix of classifications that was reviewed. We then identified equivalent positions and comparator agencies and collected salary and um, benefit uh, data and then calculated the labor market position. So the total compensation in the report includes um, benefits that are provided to all of or a majority of the employees in the classification or bargaining unit. So this would be um, insurance uh, benefits or deferred compensation and retirement. What is not included in the total compensation is something that is not given to all of the employees and this could be like a special classification pay or if we had bilingual pay that sort of thing so that was not included in the study. So the first table here which has wonderfully large numbers that you can see very clearly um, is the uh, compensation highlights for the management and confidential unit. And when looking at all of these, we provided the labor market, um, the median and the mean with just the base salary and the total compensation. For purposes of our discussions and when we were looking at um, working with the union, we took the market um, median with the total compensation so it includes the salary the benefits and it is the median number that we have which is the middle number it is not the mean not the average because if you do use the average and you have a very high number or you have a very low number that could skew the results so by going with the median you are at the middle and that is a very I don't want to say very but it's a more accurate number to use so as you can see with our management um, unit, the city is 4.73% below the market median than our comparators. Angela, if I may, for the council, um, this is page 9 and 10 on attachment 1 of the staff report. Thank you. Um, Moving next, we looked at the Teamsters miscellaneous unit. Um, and here you can see um, the positions that we uh, reviewed, again, looking at the total compensation in salary and benefits. And we took the median number again. And overall, all of these numbers here, overall, on average, there is, they are below um, by 17.35%. 
Now, if you look at some of the classifications, and um, as I just go off on a bit of a tangent, if you're looking at some of the maintenance worker ones, that one is um, quite low in comparison to our um, neighboring cities. And when talking with the Teamsters and, and looking at equity adjustments, um, and part of the reason why the report tonight mainly focuses on the series, the maintenance series, is because of the numbers you see here at this report. They are um, quite below average than, than most, and they are more so as a, as a total group than any other, I'd say, one or two employees within the, the city. We did look at the other um, unit we have with the Teamsters, the sanitation unit, and again, on the uh, market median, they were 3.9% uh, below the average. And this table just illustrates all of the, the figures that I just went through. And again, um, looking at the total average um, market median citywide, the city is about 10.36% 10, 10 below um, average. So this concludes just this um, compensation and classification study portion. It just tells you an overview of what we did in the year that we had, or just under a year that we had with CPSHR to um, do the report. Again, like they did many other things for us, but I wanted to just highlight tonight mainly the compensation piece because we are asking you to make an action this evening um, in updating our salary schedules. And so um, what I'd like to do is just give a little brief um, history on what we did with this report in our negotiations. So when we did labor negotiations back in May and June of 2019, we used the draft information in this report to um, work with the Teamsters. And we came up with a tentative agreement that council approved um, back in uh, July, and we set forth some process to start looking at equity adjustments. If you recall, we created a step F on the salary schedule for the, all of the um, represented employees. Within that tentative agreement, there were two other sections that the city was required to work with that we agreed to work on with the Teamsters. And one was in section four, and that was the creation of the maintenance worker two job classification. And we would be working on that so that, jo that job classification would become effective um, the first pay period after July 1st of 2020. The second section, which was section number five, we agreed to do equity adjustments for those classifications that were found to be below the market range and to work on a plan on how we would address those. And we needed to get that done by October 31st of 2019. We were able to do that with the Teamsters. We met with them and um, looked at all of the job classifications. And going back, we found that there were um, classifications for the maintenance worker, lead maintenance worker, senior maintenance worker, the maintenance technicians and street sweeper operator were between 12 and 26 um, percent below the area median. So we proposed a 5 percent um, equity increase to these affected job classifications. And that would then bring these classifications um, closer to the market median and align with the class and comp study that we did. And we agreed that we would um, do this so that it, um, it would go to the period that would include um, January 1st of 2020. So we'd have to bring it to December 29th. That's when the pay period starts. So we, were, um, we worked with the union on that part piece. And then the second part of it is the maintenance worker two job classification. So. Creating this maintenance worker two classification will help to provide some growth for our employees and help to have them a place to move up to and will retain or hopefully retain our employees and not have them leave to go elsewhere. Um, so we are in the process of, provide, of working on a draft um, job description for that maintenance uh, worker two um, classification. We hope that it will and anticipate that it will become effective um, you know, after July 1st of 2020, as we've agreed to with the union and RTA. And um, at this point, uh, right now, the other thing that we're working on would be to also update the evaluation form, which would um, include an area to show for growth and promotion from the 
maintenance worker one to a maintenance worker two category. So we are on track with this. We are considering, we'll be meeting with the union um, again to bring forward our draft and work with them to refining and finalizing that. And um, hopefully we'll, you'll see this coming up, forthcoming with our future negotiations. So you'll be getting some more information as we move forward with this. Um, overall, the fiscal impact for the um, increase for the 5% for this, the remainder of this fiscal year would be um, $60,000, which 30,000 would come from the general fund and 30 would come from the other remaining enterprise funds. And then overall for the fiscal year 2021, it would be 120,000 with 60,000 coming from the general fund and 60 from the enterprise funds. So if you adopt the uh, resolution this evening, um, it will, update the salary schedule for the, those classifications in that maintenance worker series, and um, it will become effective um, as of December 29th, 2019. So this concludes my report, and if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, uh, Councilman Lee. Uh, thank you, Angela, and your staff, and everybody else worked on this very difficult uh, and very big report. Um, I, uh, I agree with most, um, I guess I don't have any problems. I, I thank you for trying to provide opportunities um, for um, our staff to grow. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, op promotional opportunities, I think that's important. Uh, this, so if this, if we approve all of this and we, and we try to meet all of these um, salary increases, so what we just approved, uh, the schedule fees, then it would no longer be 100% cost recovery, right? Just, just clarification. Well, no, that's that's not because the five percent increase that we're proposing you adopt this evening is for our maintenance workers, and they're not included in, in those um, cost recovery fees. The, the fees this evening were for services for plan check and that type of thing. But. In the future, yes, we're going to have to watch that. So that's a good, good note and a good point. That's a good comment, uh, Councilman Oliva. Well, I just want to say thank you very much for that report. I like the fact that you looked in um, from the the top the top of the mountain down because it wasn't just about uh, the salaries, which were obviously so important, but yet you're uh, alleviating a lot of problems in the future. So thank you, Angela. Thank you. That just to be very clear, it's twenty seven. Um, employees that right. make up this group that are, we're looking at. So um, when I did the presentation to the um, staff, I had to say, you know, look, we know that there are areas that we'll, we'll look at and we will at some point get to addressing um, some of these large disparities, but we have a huge group of employees, a majority of our employees that we have that are severely um, you know, below the mark, and we need to bring or help bring them up to equity so that we can, you know, retain them. And, and also, if we retain our employees, you know, then we don't have to keep training people or recruiting or doing all that other stuff, which is a cost. And in the long run, the cost is probably much greater for us. So thank you very much. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. Um, thank you, too. It was great reading. Um, I'm fully in support, but I have a couple of questions. Uh, number one, and it wasn't part of the recommendations tonight, we've got a couple of, of worker categories that are under the $15 amount. And the state law for minimum $15 per hour goes into effect in, goes into effect in soon. For $15 an hour for minimum wage would be 2022. So we do adopt right now. We're on the schedule on just the schedule where we should be with minimum wage, which minimum wage went up on just first, and I believe it's first, and I believe it's at $13 an hour. So we are in compliance. We are in compliance with the minimum wage for the state right now. I thought I'm trying to find it. I thought I saw 12.80 still in here. So, um, so, but I, it was my understanding that we will be coming back and looking at the minimum wage. Correct. Uh, we are working on a minimum wage and wage theft ordinance bringing the city council. Trial. Excellent. My other questions are going to sound like, what does it have to do with this? Um, I appreciate all the work that our maintenance workers are doing, and sometimes they don't get a lot of love. 
and what I am hoping that the city might do is have a website that lists the projects that they've completed, what they're working on, what are some of the things coming up so that the public can see what they're doing because there have been some great strides in the city, but it's really hard to communicate. So at least if we can get it on the website, we can say, ah, look, they, they, whatever the project might be on that. And then my other one was um, street sweepers. Um, it's a very valuable service. It's part, it's gonna be part of our climate resiliency plan. When we are so inundated with cars, the street sweeper can't get to the gutter to pick up the leaves or the litter in them. So I'm hoping that you will come back to us, staff will come back to us with a plan to go back to what Millbury used to have, which we had to use our, move our cars. Like on my street, I had to move my car Tuesday morning if it was parked on the street. So I just wanna make life easier for the street cleaner so that he can actually do his or her job. All right, do we have a, uh, a motion? Okay, we have a motion from Councilman Lee and a second from uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. Uh, your votes, please. Ms. Ray, I, well, go ahead, sorry. Item number 11 passed unanimously. Yes. I was going to say, hey, this is a good discussion this evening, and I, I think it's appropriate for me to publicly state, I just thank all of our employees for coming together and being team players on this and understanding where maintenance workers were. And uh, my, my hat goes off to all of our employees for meeting and understanding where we are and really working together to get us healthy one step at a time. So on behalf of all our employees and the team, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, this was a wonderful collaboration between our staff and uh, Teamsters Local 856. Mr. Mayor, for the uh, order. Yes, uh, Councilman Pepin. Um, would anyone have an objection to moving up item 14? We do have a guest speaker. That would be fine, and we do have a speaker slip for that as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, move on to item 14. Thank the you. Resolution on seamless transportation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do have uh, Mr. Ian Griffiths here this evening uh, from Seamless. Bay Area, who will be providing a presentation here shortly. But just in terms of introduction, this item is to consider a resolution supporting the idea of a seamless transportation system throughout the Bay Area. Uh, currently, as you may know, there are 27 different transportation agencies in the Bay Area. Here in the city of Millbrae, as small as we are, because we have the multimodal transit station known as the BART station, we deal with four different transit agencies. And we have found that in dealing with four different transit agencies for, cer for one station that services BART patrons, SAMTRANS patrons, Caltrain patrons, that we run into a lot of, of, of conflict and issues in terms of the ultimate service delivery, whether it be you know ticketing, parking, um, those types of issues. So I think that this is a, a very important idea and concept. Um, and as you'll hear in the presentation, there have been several cities as well as the Cities Association, Santa Clara County, that have already adopted this resolution. And uh, so we as staff um, would recommend uh, adoption of the resolution. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ian Griffiths from the uh, Seamless Bay Area for a quick presentation. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Ian Griffiths, uh, Policy Director with Seamless Bay Area. Um, and our organization, we are a nonprofit organization. Our, our mission is to transform the Bay Area's uh, fragmented and inconvenient public transit into a world-class, unified, equitable, and widely used system by building a diverse movement for change and promoting the policy reforms that can help us build that seamless transit system. And the resolution before you today is to adopt a, the, the a resolution supporting the seamless transit principles, which is a public-facing set of seven principles I'll read through them just very briefly. One, run Bay, all Bay Area transit as one easy to use system. Two, put riders first. Three, make public transit equitable and accessible to all. Four, align transit prices to be simple, fair, and affordable. Five, connect effortlessly with other sustainable transportation. Six, plan communities and transportation together. And seven, prioritize reforms to create a seamless network. Um, this is not, in practice, how we are operating our regional transportation system today. And it's important to have, we're, we're trying to build a coalition of groups and cities to really express the importance of adopting this policy framework. Uh, transit should be 
the backbone of our region and most cities uh, support an increasing amount of transit ridership, but yet our investments in the past have not led to increasing transit use. And we've in fact seen declines in public transit performance over the past couple of decades, despite many counties and cities uh, investing in service. Um, so we're seeing increasing commute times, lowering bus speeds. Um, we've been out talking to everyday people who use transit or who might want to use transit. What we find is there's so many members of the public want to use public transit. They want to uh, pick a more sustainable way of getting around, uh, but they just, they find it's not a convenient system. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for their life. It's too confusing. It's not reliable. Um, they want a higher functioning system. Um, we see uh, the importance also of this resolution right now is we have, we're having this regional conversation of a major new source of transportation funding. There are groups advocating to put a ballot measure uh, to raise a, a large amount of money for transit, and we think that's absolutely essential. We're happy to see that polling suggests that the public really wants to see more investment in transit, and they support that type of investment when it's associated with words like seamless, reliable, fast, and affordable. That's what people want. But at the same time, that there's limited trust in the capacity of our existing public agencies to deliver on that, and our two largest newspapers uh, came out with editorials over the over this summer expressing you know yes we need more funding for transit but we need to have we need to have reforms that ensure that we break from this fragmented approach that we've had in the past and we truly create an integrated network um, we have 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area, and it's really not working. It's it's not working for any part of the region. There's no region that's very well served by, uh, by our current system, which is, for many people, not logical. And there's no clear regional vision for the integration and the long-term planning of the network. Um, many of the transit agencies are struggling with some of the same issues, and we're spending billions on our transit investments that have not increased transit ridership over time. This is only getting more and more urgent as we have a rapid technological change uh, that are bringing new forms of mobility and could uh, could uh, help us face more challenges. And we know this comes to a head more than anywhere in Millbrae. Uh, you, you experience it firsthand with so many transit agencies coming together, needing to deal with the, uh, the frustrations of someone just missing their train and the schedules not being coordinated, or we're dealing with a longer range planning issues around having so many different transit agencies uh, not necessarily communicating with each other on long term planning projects. So to be clear is what we're trying to achieve with this with this resolution and as an organization of where we want what we think the Bay Area should be orienting itself towards is a seamless customer focused regional network where the rapid transit network is strategically planned at a regional level to actually work as a system where transit agencies work together to operate different parts of an integrated network where service quality fare schedules and wayfinding and other components of the of the customer experience are standardized to be as reliable and as seamless as possible for the end user, and where our transit and high capacity vehicles move quickly on all of our uh, regional roads. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, Bay Area is a complicated place, it's a diverse region, but there are other similarly complicated regions that have that have found ways to create a more seamless system. Um, so we like to use the example of Frankfurt in the greater Frankfurt area in Germany. This is another polycentric region with lots of different employment centers, uh, urban, suburban, rural areas, 160 different transit operators, 408 municipalities. So even more uh, fragmented in many ways than the Bay Area, but uh, they've they introduced a coordinated governance framework, a, a transit alliance of all those those different transit operators to be able to coordinate the service in the early 90s. And since that point, they've seen a 60% growth in transit ridership um, and a much more coordinated approach towards long range planning. During that same period of time, we've only had 16% growth in transit ridership in the Bay Area. So that's the scale of the potential uh, change that we believe is possible in the Bay Area if we address some of the core issues that, that result in our fragmented approach to transit. So moving back to the resolution itself and the seamless transit principles, change is hard and we need to be able, we're trying to build that public support and the support from places all across the Bay Area uh, to show that we're ready to take on this important challenge. We've had 1,350 members of the public sign on to a petition in support of these seamless transit principles and 17 organizations publicly 
support. And as uh, the city manager mentioned, the Cities Association of Santa Clara County is the most recent group of cities representing 15 cities in Santa Clara County. And the city of Berkeley passed a resolution late last year. We have other resolutions in progress with the city of San Francisco uh, that we expect in the next couple of uh, months. Uh, Burlingame, Sunnyvale are some of the others that we're hoping we'll have soon. So the resolution uh, just is to affirm commitment to work collaboratively with all of the different players in the Bay Area towards a more seamless transit system um, and to support the seamless trans transit principles and have the city listed as a supporter publicly on the website. Happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Councilman Pepin? Amen. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Uh, we have needed this for a very long time until uh, your organization has put this together. It's been just an ongoing battle. Uh, have any transit agencies actually signed on to this? Uh, no, but we are working, uh, we're BART and Marin Transit are the two that we have been working with board members to try to make that happen in the next couple of months as well. Good luck with that. Um, has this been presented to CCAG or MTC? I don't think so. Are you you presented to MTC, but there was no. We have had staff meetings. We've had uh, we've never presented at MTC, but we've had several meetings with different MTC staff, and we've not yet met with anyone at CCAG. Uh, the problem that we have dealt with throughout Millbrae and. We're very excited to have this here is that we talk to transit agencies all the time and none of them ever um, resolve issues they just say we met uh, the only thing we've been able to do is actually get BART to the airport once again and that was like pulling teeth uh, just to make that happen but thankfully the airport stepped up so I'm very excited to see you here, what we are missing, and I hope um, we can approach this at the state level, legislatively speaking, because this type of measure doesn't cost the taxpayers anything. The transit agencies need to be made accountable as to the schedules and all these principles that you have. Uh, I think and I hope we can work with our legislators to make them accountable to this, but I'm so glad this is being presented to the city of Millbrae, and we look forward to working with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider? A couple of quick questions. Um, on the whereases, the third whereas talks about the reduction in per capita trips by bus, but in Millbrae at least we have a number of private corporate shuttle buses. Does that take into account the switch between public to private? just in terms of accuracy, or the fact that we deal with private shuttle traffic? I believe I would have to go check on that data source. I, 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 I'm not positive whether the mode share includes private shuttles as an option or, or not, but I can get back and to And just that. so that you understand, for these private shuttles to be able to get their employees in and out of the BART station or train station, we had to design our TOD around that. And the disconnect was they want to pick up as close to the escalator at BART, for example, which means they don't go past the new retail, which means, again, we don't make a penny in sales tax. Well, that's what I remember from meetings. So that's what I'm going to hold in mind. So. That's, that's my interpretation of where we had to put bike bus shuttles on things rather than moving them out where they had to walk a tenth of a mile. Okay. Um, Transit Alliance. Oh, uh, I, I serve on the county BPAC. Is any of this going to look in at bicycle corridors that feed into transit? So one of the principles is uh, connect effortlessly with other sustainable transportation. So we do support excellent pedestrian and bicycle connections. We think that needs to be part of uh, how we, you know, the 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 accountability of uh, regionally of uh, ensuring that we both invest in those uh, those modes as part of an integrated transportation plan, and that we, uh, especially for routes of regional significance, uh, you know, uh, oversee them at that level. So the reason I bring 
that up is um, each city probably has its own set of wayfaring signs. I was at the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition Summit in Mountain View this summer, and Mountain View has just recently put a new bicycle-specific road signs, which are really cool. You can see them from the level that you're on at a bicycle. They tell you how far you are before you can connect with, say, the California Street Station in Palo Alto, et cetera. And when I came back to our county and talked about signage, and we've talked about it before, there's no consistency in bike signage throughout the Bay Area. So that would be a great area where there is some consistency. And that means as you're riding along, you can always kind of anticipate where you might need to see that signage. So that would be a, an advantage to that. My, um, I, I'm all for this. I absolutely am so angry, as some of your co, because they talked to me last night, at the control that transit agencies have over Millbrae. The absolute incalcitrance of Caltrain so that we can realign a street and finish a project is absolutely unacceptable. And the same with high-speed rail. And I was probably the biggest high-speed rail supporter of this council, and now not so much. So I am hesitant on giving yet one more body having control over us. Managed lanes going in on, on 101 may or may not take away more trees, which are the one thing to protect us from the noise from the airport. Millbrae has been the brunt of helping everybody else at the cost of our own residents, and I'm tired of it. But I support the resolution. The concept is good, but I'm scared to death with one more entity saying, Milbury, this is what you have to do. Okay. Um, Councilman Lee. Uh, thank you for your efforts. It's, I'm pretty, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, uh, admirable uh, goal. Um, my dream is, yeah, to be, to be seamless, but I really think that we that 27 transit district in one region uh, it just doesn't make sense to me uh, because if you go around other countries, not around the world, so you have just one transit regional transit agency. And I understand the um, people want to protect their victims and that sort of thing. So I, I, I give you uh, many prayers and and hopefulness. Um, have you guys ever done a study on how much each agency costs to run um, administratively? Uh, suggestions on how they can become more f uh, financially uh, stable? or um, Because it seems to me like we could save billions of dollars in a loan um, and effectively inc uh, if make our services more effective if we would, if we wouldn't consolidate some transit agencies which companies do all the time in order to become more efficient and save money. So our organization has not uh, done a study. Uh, MTC did uh, some work on that 10, uh, 10 or so years ago um, as part of a project called the Transit Sustainability Project. Um, and they found some opportunities for cost savings, others where maybe you know there weren't as many benefits as they thought. We are positioning this initial, I mean, this set of re transit, the principles are really focused on creating the, the seamless customer experience for riders and having that be the driving policy objective. We hope that there would be efficiencies in doing that, um, but we're not prescribing a particular solution or we're not prescribing uh, even uh, the question of, of whether that would involve agency mergers or not, or more the sort of German model that I was referring to before, which is more of an alliance model. So uh, it's really focused on the customer. Councilman Oliva? So I like the alliance model. I think that's the approach. Otherwise, there's too many um, organizations that want to be in charge. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians here. So, and I love the I love the idea. Thank you very much. I, I was I wanted a question a little bit about what's the business plan, the business approach on your end. To um, I mean, obviously you came to our council meeting and you and you have uh, 17 other organizations that are on board that have signed up to let you do your work and whether or not anybody signs up to this, you're going to continue, I hope, to do the work. But what, what's the approach of uh, how are you going to get everybody to go on board and then what? Great. Yeah. Well, we're working on a number of different uh, strategies. Um, uh, 
w one is working directly with transit agencies and, and agencies like MTC to advance initiatives that can make a real difference in this. Uh, so one of those things uh, that we're currently working on is advocacy to support integrated fares, so a common fare system for the Bay Area. And our advocacy um, was was part of making sure that that moved forward uh, and is that the council is taking or the MTC is moving that forward this year. We're also working. Uh, we're trying to. We're working with state legislators on uh, possible state legislation uh, that would be in association with a major regional funding measure to make sure that we accompany new funding with the appropriate policies uh, that can support a seamless transit system. So having a wide range of cities, uh, as well as other public agencies, to show our state legislators that this is an important policy priority for the people of different parts of the region, that's an important part of our advocacy strategy. Can I follow up? Sure. So um, the policy part I understand, so are you saying that the solution is money? We. There needs to improve, to create the seamless vision that I was referring to. We're going to need money, but we're also going to need reforms. That's what I'm asking. What is the money? What, what do so you the, need so, the money for? So the, the the funding that the region is discussing raising is through a ballot measure. That that is not something that we are directly. You know, that is not our primary initiative. We're, we're engaging in those conversations. We're focusing our efforts on identifying what are the reforms uh, and the governance changes that should accompany new funding to ensure that we spend it effectively and to ensure that we actually build that seamless transit system with any new money that we identify and that we're not just sort of, you know, throwing money at a system that's not really functioning and, and, and that's going to repeat the mistakes that it's made in the past. Perfect. So if I could be clear, your group, Seamless, would, yeah. would, would um, control the money that was no. No, no sorry. No, no. So we're a nonprofit and we are, we are working with legislators to advocate for legislation that would uh, look at reforming existing public institutions. So we're not, we have no, we are a nonprofit, we are not, our, our objective is, you know, policy reforms, uh, not anything that we ourselves would, would benefit or profit from. And we are not asking, you know, we, we do, in terms of how we are funded, uh, we have some funding from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, uh, individual donors, a wide number of, so we do fundraising uh, that support our advocacy activities, but we're not asking any funding of the city of Millbrae, just, just the support for the resolution. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but I, you mentioned, you know, fair uh, coordination, and I think one of the challenges is that each of these agencies are in such different, you know, fiscal shapes where you have, you know, BART and Caltrain are fairly efficient in terms of fear box recovery, 70, 80 percent, and I was reading, I think, the Smart Train up in the North Bay, they're only recovering maybe 10 percent of their costs through, um, maybe not quite that low, but, but a very low percentage of their cost through, through the fair. So there would have to be some administrative changes and some questions about how exactly this whole type of system would be funded. Um, and obviously, there's our geographic uh, challenges as well, where, you know, the center of our region is a large body of water uh, that makes um, it difficult for, uh, it makes commute everything farther apart and, and long commute times and uh, also the, the housing issue um, involved with that. Um, but I think this is a, a great idea. I think there's a lot of work that can be done in this area. I traveled, you know, to Paris last year, and it was amazing just how integrated all of the, you know, the, the metro with the, com with the commuter rail, with the buses, with the light rail, um, and you can use the same ticket for each one, and it was very low cost, very affordable, very reliable service, and you can easily transfer from one to the other without having to, you know, pay buy another ticket. Um, so I, I think we have, have a lot of work to do and a lot of common sense solutions um, that can be implemented here um, so that we don't have people, you know, missing connections all the time, which I see almost every day at Millbrae, mm -hmm. um, you know, where the BART arrives and people get off and they run over, or the Caltrain arrives, they run over to BART and the doors close right before they can get in, or they have to run all the way up the stairs and then all the way down on the other side and, and miss the connections. Um, so uh, we, we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do, and, and I applaud you and your organization for trying to address these um, these challenges. Um, we do have a couple of uh, speaker slips on this issue. Uh, so the first speaker we have is Nathan Chan. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I just want to thank the city council for again for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. Um, I just want to tell my own personal uh, story about um, about how a seamless transit system can work delightfully. So I work in Emeryville. Um, I would have probably had to drive if there weren't a seamless connection available for me. But thanks to the fact that the Emery go round shuttle within Emeryville pretty much lines up with when the BART train arrives at MacArthur, I rarely have to wait more than three to five minutes uh, for the shuttle to leave, and then I can get to work and I feel I can get to work in a reasonable, bearable amount of time. And that makes riding trans transit not just a viable alternative, but a superior alternative for me. So I really think that the council should full-throatedly support uh, the resolution before them. Um, I heard a couple of council members express some concerns about uh, the power imbalance between uh, the cities and the transit agencies. I actually think that this is a perfect vehicle for uh, forcing more accountability upon the transit agencies. Uh, the San Mateo Grand Jury last year uh, reprimanded Samtrans for not coordinating their schedules more closely with uh, Caltrain. So if there was the Grand Jury report and then Seamless and then all of these cities and transit rider uh, unions, like associations of transit riders, all standing up and saying, you need to really shape up. You, got, you all need to take the existing infrastructure and use it more efficiently. I think that sends a very strong message to these transit agencies that we want them to do better. And I think that is empowering for us. It's not about surrendering more control to them. Um, that is pretty much all I think I wanted to say. I, I remember, or maybe just one more thing. I, I remember last year I saw a presentation from another seamless organizer, and this is really like a transit rider grassroots effort. It's not being, as far as I can tell, it's not being coordinated by MTC or any of the big professional associations. This is very much about transit riders and transit advocates wanting uh, the transit agencies to uh, provide a better experience that we all know that they're capable of. They just need to uh, pony up and start doing it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Uh, the next speaker is Jeff Carter. Go Niners. <laughs> <laughs> go Niners, go Stanford. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Carter, uh, 11 Cordiana, Millbrae here. Uh, the airport's in my, literally in my backyard. Um, but I've been using the train from Millbrae to San Francisco since 1977. Uh, you know, the old, old original station and now the, uh, the new, what I call monstrosity Millbrae station, <laughs> because it is difficult at Millbrae. Um, I take the train first thing in the morning. The train, BART leaves at 5.34, and the Caltrain leaves, pulls in at 5.36. So there's no coordination, and I've seen, you know, there's a couple people that do like to try to connect, and they try, but it's just difficult for them to uh, try to connect between Caltrain and BART. And then the opposite direction, you have to circumnavigate stairs, slow elevators to get from one system to the other. So it's just very, very uncoordinated. Uh, trying to get to the bus from Caltrain or BART is extremely difficult because the bus is up on El Camino and you have to, you know, it's, it's that's an adventure to try to get, you know, connect to the bus, you know, the ECR bus from the uh, from either the uh, Caltrain or the BART because the, the bus does not pull right into the station. It used to pull, in, pull into that turnaround, but that was also difficult because the bus had to go through traffic lights and et cetera. And, you know, it was just so it's just terrible compared to, you know, someplace in Europe. Um, the um, <clears throat> lost my chance. I, I'm very tired. Uh, <laughs> 
but anyway, um, this is, you know, it's, 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 I fully support this. I appreciate the seamless Bay Area working on this. Um, you know, coordination is, is uh, needed. Um, you know, fares need to be coordinated. Uh, Clipper was created as a, as a vehicle to start coordinating fares, but it really hasn't happened. Now they're talking about Clipper 2.0, and there's resistance from transit agencies to coordinate fares because we, there's been discussions at Caltrain Advisory Committee meeting on Clipper 2.0, and you know somebody brought up, well, let's you know what about coordinating the fares, and they throw Brown Act at you right away. Well, it's not on the agenda; we can't discuss it. But Clipper 2.0 is about coordinating fares, and then the, the other answer is, well, the fare would have to be so high that nobody would use it because the transit agencies are afraid of u losing revenue. So you know they're they're all about their fiefdoms, uh, and and you know. They they want to be in charge, but we need to see coordination, you know, you know, under one umbrella so that it makes the system much easier to use for the user, the rider. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy? Yes, uh, Councilwoman Pepin. Um, and just as a follow-up, um, I will be pushing these elements, MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission has a retreat this month, and I'm hoping they will focus on all of these things. They did pass. Uh, legisl or, uh, resolution for fair integration after many, many years. So that study is going on presently to do away with the fiefdoms, as the last speaker said, that we have to have these um, aspects within transportation to make it seamless. And all the issues that Council Member Lee and I brought up with the current uh, general manager at BART, the stations are unsafe, they're dirty, um, they've created a public health hazard, as is the lack of law enforcement at the stations. Um, I will say, and I'm going to report out, that I voted against giving BART another $35 million. Uh, one of which of the elements was for more police officers, but they would not be in our region. So this money was being recycled because, as you said, the agency from the South was non-performing. I thought the money should be given more to Caltrain than BART, which has been completely non-responsive. So unless we make them accountable, we need to start pulling the purse strings back. And the element I think Council Member Oliva was mentioning, there is a measure they call Faster Bay Area which is the tax that they want to impose. The aspects of seamless Bay Area here, I think, are really important, and I don't see the public being willing to support the faster aspect unless seamless um, performance measures and accountability are imposed on these agencies now. So I applaud the council and our representative here for presenting this aspect, and I hope we will all support this. Thank you. And I don't want to get off topic here, but there's a, another question about faster of whether it should be yet another sales tax, of which there have been many. As opposed to a different type of, of uh, revenue measure. Uh, um, is this the one they're talking about for November 2020? I believe so, yes. It would have to have a state legislature approval to put it on the ballot. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Pappen and a second by Councilman Lee. Uh, your votes, please. Item 14 passed unanimously. Okay, um, so going back now to item 12, the uh, council discussion and appointments to subcommittees for 2020, they recommended Subcommittees are in the folder here. Um, if you haven't had a moment to look it over, um, feel free to. Not on the fold-out sheet, but in the, the single sheet. Uh, um, yes. There is no Grand Boulevard anymore. So it, it's, okay. it's no, still Nobody on mentioned the... that in uh, the, uh, the emails because that I, I sent out. It to an, I, I'm sorry, I didn't okay. even see it because I mentioned it three or four months ago when they disbanded the public representative uh, part of that, it's gone. 
Yeah, uh, council member did mention that to us, and that's an oversight on our part. Okay. So. I think I think I yeah. You, Apologize for that. Correct. Comment. I forgot. I, I do have one quick comment. Oh yes, uh, council member. Um, so. We're not, you're talking about disbanding some of the subcommittees? So, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different things. The actual item on the agenda is the sub... Oh, oh disbanding the subcommittees, yes. Um, so there were, I think, five subcommittees that I would recommend um, disbanding, just that have been inactive recently. Um, and there's also, you know, the community garden, which has completed its work. Um, the cannabis subcommittee I was on two years. I did not meet a single time. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I believe the the military unit subcommittee was created for the parade and the event that occurred two years ago. But um, as far as I know, there are no other nothing else planned in in within the city or within San Mateo County. Yeah, I just want to clarify that we're still adopting this. We are, oh, absolutely. Not gonna, yes. We're not going to remove the DAPs in the unit, and I am the uh, contact for. Okay. Eventually. And and you know if, if there are any events or anything that you feel that you know the city member should be involved, please let us know, and either through a subcommittie or through. Um, no, no, we're not. We're disbanding that groups. subcommittee, right? Okay. Got we it. could always make a new subcommittee if we need. Just to. a question on that yes. one. Um, so. Um, I'm an advisor to the Millbury Lions Youth Club, the Leos. The Leos decided that they would send gifts to our unit. Um, I went out and bought the chocolate for the Leos and a Hanukkah gift, and they made homemade cards, and the box is still sitting in my house because we can't find the unit. So, yeah, we, um, and it turns also. out that a lot of the colonel had moved on to a different thing. So I, I agree with getting rid of the, the unit, but I think we have a little no, bit no, of no, work, the subcommittee, the, the, the subcommittee the but, the but, and the, the data on our website is wrong. Um, I just would love to see us, maybe Councilman Lee, you and I can sit down and we can do a little tweaking and get it up to speed. Yeah, and, me, uh, and then our residents can participate in the process. Yeah, I think um, the other thing too is that uh, our, uh, our city manager Tom Williams is a veteran, and we want to do something for our veterans too. So um, we can do something, uh, uh, you know, on the same vein. Okay. Um, so as for the subcommittee recommendations, are there any comments or any requests or suggestions, <coughs> Councilman Pavin? Um, I don't know how Councilmember Schneider feels, but um, the bike slash scooter. Uh, <laughs> Committee, I, I, I think we were so close. Um, I would like to see that continue. Um, I would love to see it continue too. The question is, um, do we do it at our level or does it go under the new Millbrae Very Active by Pedestrian Committee? I don't, I don't know. How would you like it, Councilwoman? Uh, well, I think we were talking about getting into a contract with a specific provider. We did. So we were I ready think to that has to be day. stopped uh, providing bike shares. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that has to be more of a city subcommittee that can bring a contract to the council. And um, if the city manager could let us know, if, I mean, there are other providers out there. Can I throw something else in? I sent an article, I think, to the BPAC, the Millbury BPAC. Um, they now have electric Vespas, um, given that the mayor was in Italy, it was in France. When you're in Italy, you're in Vespa country, and I rode one when I was a youngster. And in Milan, which is incredibly congested, you see Vespas all over the place. So it was just recently they're testing electric Vesta, uh, renting electric Vespas in Oakland. So it's the first place on the West Coast. There's some exciting new things that Called give you that offers them in San I'd, Francisco. I'd have to put well, yeah, this was specifically testing um, in Oakland uh, on there, and, and it gives you enough room to put packages so you could, in theory, use it to get groceries and get home. You know, it, it, so I'd love to continue doing on this if you're open to yeah, keeping it, the committee. The two of you would like to continue on sure. that, please. Is that okay with um, and if, if I could note, too, the um, rideshare companies like Uber and Lyft, who we are not fans of here, I know, but they are also in the bike and scooter biz. 
so you can actually get an app. So uh, I think we have new alternatives to evaluate, and I appreciate the council's willingness to do so. Yeah, the scooters and electric bikes and all that. Okay. And Mayor, just yes. um, just point of clarification, it was my understanding at our council meeting where we created the infrastructure subcommittee that it's infrastructure and climate change. Yes. Okay. Uh, so if we could just get climate change in there, I would be very happy. Okay. We, we can do that. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, we didn't put it in because it's, it's just a subset of, of infrastructure. I can go back and look at the, the actual agenda item. <laughs> or look at the tape. But I, I believe that would be, you know, climate resiliency, I believe, is, would be under the work. It, it all climate. falls under there so you don't have to you know, it's a bigger it's, it's more because it goes climate change affects many departments too and but it all in infrastructure I, I think it, the reason why it's great to have it standalone is we are going to have that climate action plan coming to us one of these days and we know that our young people are dropping off and volunteering for certain activities but they're very interested in doing climate change related activities so uh, let's start pulling in our young folk and then um, as for the other committee assignments, if somebody really di didn't get something that you really wanted and would like to do some horse trading or request, um, you, know, uh, you know, feel free to ask um, the person who is listed as the, as the delegate for uh, or liaison, um, and we can make accommodations. Yes. Yep. Yes, this has to do with Peninsula Clean Energy. So Wayne has been the person since the get-go, and I've been the alternate. I have the problem that the County Bicycle Pedestrian Committee meets the same time. Now, we only meet about eight times a year. The one critical meeting is October when we vote on giving out grants. Um, so because of schedules, and I, I don't can't speak for Councilman Lee, but I think both of us had an incredibly busy 2019, so we've missed a few meetings. and. There was a discussion at the retreat on Saturday about the governance of it, and it was recognized that they like that every city is there and they want every city there. This is my long way of getting to uh, some of the cities have their city manager as another designee that can go, because you have to go through a, uh, I can't remember, Wayne, it's been four years, a background check, or there's there's a couple of other, other layers for being in this quasi-governmental unit. I don't know if, if our... No, I don't our, think our city think manager is interested, but Brisbane sends their city manager. South San Francisco sends their city manager if their council members can't attend. I, I, yeah, we brought this up, uh, way in the beginning, and the council just, well, that that time the council decided they, didn't, they wanted just council members. No, well, no, so, I think this could be a third if we wanted it. No, There's, no, I'm, I'm I'm open to it. I think that uh, there are times when I can't and you can't, um, and uh, if city and no another council member can't go, then we can ask city staff to send somebody. It's just in this case, this is like um, CCAG. If you haven't gotten prior approval and had something the only, over no, your head, only, you don't get to sit at the table. No, you the actually only, have the to go through the background. No, I, there's, no there's nothing like that I'm aware of, but I, I know that the council is the, is the governing board. The city council is decide who they want to send as their representative. There, that was the only... Oh, that was the only. There couldn't be like a, somebody as a one-time alternate. If, if I don't think so, because you go through these additional checks and you have to do a form 700. You've got to have these things in place. So I think we should just think about maybe having a, a, a set, an additional backup for. I, it. I, I I I agree with that, and I think um, you know, normally what we do is we just if the other alternate doesn't work out, we ask another council member to go. Um, in this case, I think if the council is okay with sending staff, then that's what we can do. But I think. We did agree that we would keep it to the council. Let's let's maybe keep it to the council for now. And if we've noticed we've had multiple absences, <laughs> three in a row last year. Okay. Yeah, three in a row. And I apologize. I just was out of country or BPAC. And the, uh, the Caltrain local policymakers group was the same time as well. So you know, it, that's a good point because I've talked to Supervisor Horsley. There's been talk in the pack for the county BPAC of trying to find a different night because there are two other meetings that everybody, that everybody comes late to BPAC and has a difficulty getting a quorum. Um, um, and sometimes we don't do anything. Sometimes we don't do it. And then there's the one meeting. And then there's the one meeting. We don't do anything. We, get, we don't do anything. We get you know, we get educated. You know, we get educated. But I will try my best. I will try my best to change my mind. Because I like being on it. But it's a conflict. It's a conflict. I love the 
Uh, so I love the committee. Just, in fact, uh, it just so happens tomorrow I have a funeral since I have all four of you here and I need some coverage for the Senior Advisory Committee. Would somebody step up for me? Senior Advisory Committee tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Senior Advisory Committee at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and, and we don't have, I, I think, I don't think there were any issues last year with not having alternates for um, committee liaisons. That was uh, a change from previous years, but um, I think it worked out well. I don't, um, and if you are to be absent, miss one of these meetings and would like coverage, please um, contact the city manager or the city clerk or myself, and we can arrange for um, an alternate to attend. Okay, um, so we have a motion from Councilman Lee to accept the subcommittee recommendations, including the um, continuation of the bike share um, subcommittee, uh, and a second from Vice Mayor Schneider. Uh, your votes, please. Item number 12 passed unanimously. Okay, item 13 is an informational report on Broadway tree planting project. I know this had been, I believe, continued from a previous meeting, um, and it's it's only an informational report, so maybe if we can keep it very brief here since it's, uh, it's getting late. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I will keep it very brief. Uh, this is item. This is an item continuing from, from the November 2019 uh, council meeting since we ran out of time uh, that night. So, Keelan Public Works Director. So tonight, I'm going to be standing in front of you talking about some of the great work we have done on Broadway, especially in the uh, 400 block of Broadway by uh, Dean Produce, between uh, Taylor and Hillcrest. So as you see on this picture, there are three beautiful trees on that block. And why do we go and remove those trees? And those are the answers most of you like to know. And we're going to tell you why. Some of the trees, uh, a couple of those trees actually have caused quite a lot of uh, damage to the sidewalk. They pose a tripping hazard to, uh, to our uh, shoppers downtown, to people that walk along the sidewalk on downtown. And recently, late last year, we actually have two incidents. The tree actually split in the middle. The tree was diseased and they were rotted and they fell on the vehicles that parked near the trees. And like I mentioned, there were two incidents within a month or so. So we decided because of that, the trees are in such an unhealthy state, we decided to uh, come up with a planting scheme to replace those trees. And this is what we have done. This is just a comparison picture. There were three big trees on the top pictures, and then one we clear cut out uh, the trees on that same block. You will see how clear that is, and it wasn't looking too attractive. So we came up with a design scheme. Uh, we actually borrowed some idea back in 2016 under the leadership of then Mayor's uh, Annie Oliva. We had a downtown uh, uh, pilot demo project where we improved the intersections of Broadway and Hillcrest. And we got a lot of great feedback from the, both residents and businesses about those improvements a few years ago. So those trees that we replanted on Broadway, those are called Tristinias. And it, instead of replacing three, we actually replanted five trees. And you could, as you can see from the engineering pictures here, we actually put some thought into uh, the replanting scheme. We're using the same tree grades we had at the intersection at uh, Hillcrest and, and Broadway, and also the way how we align those uh, planting. We try not to obstruct the front door to other businesses or blocking their businesses. We place those trees in between two businesses. And for future uh, planting purposes along uh, Broadway, we will continue with the, uh, with the same scheme. We'll use the uh, same species using the same uh, tree grade. And at the same time, uh, just uh, walking across the street right adjacent to uh, Zen uh, Sushi place. There was a uh, city uh, parking lot and we had two fairly large trees there that had caused quite a lot of damage to pavement and also uh, water infrastructure in the area. And we also decided to remove these uh, two big trees that you could see they have caused quite a bit of pavement damage there. 
and this is the finished product. We replace, uh, we remove two trees and we replace with seven Tristina trees along the uh, planting strips uh, adjacent to the parking lot. And with that, that concludes my report and I'd like to, uh, love to uh, answer any question you may have. Uh, Councilman Pappen? Uh, yes, please. The two trees in the city parking lot that caused the extensive damage to the main water backflow, um, can we get some sort of um, foliage or landscaping in there instead? Those of us who are doing the citywide cleaning, um, the city manager and council member Lee and I noticed because we were working the downtown area there, you get less trash if it is landscaped in such a way with, of course, water resistant plants. Um, otherwise, that's going to be just one big ashtray. Uh, so I would really like to see something there. Um, some shrubbery, something nice. Uh, otherwise, we're just adding nothing. Well, definitely the reason why we have not been installing any ground cover because we had a concrete pad that we recently pulled and there will be some concrete damage that we have to replace. When we finish those concrete work, we will uh, uh, installing some ground covers there. Um, and some sort of this, I don't know, this might be the time, something there. Is this an area for a bioswell or something? Is that, did I say it right? Uh, is, um, I, I think you refer to uh, Councilwoman Pappen, uh, green infrastructure. Well, oh. I, no, I don't know, but the county was given money to like Burlingame and stuff. You can see in their downtown area. Yes, yes. I mean, if we can get some free money for something like Definitely. that area, but I just don't think we should be leaving that. Um, in the current condition that shows in that picture. Sure, definitely. This is, like I said, this is an unfinished product because of the recent concrete work, and it will be, uh, it will be some pretty attractive ground cover there once we are finished. Your definition of attractive and mine might be very, but hopefully <laughs> something good. Is that going to be similar to what we did in front of City Hall? Um, I do not think so. It will be some sort of a, 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 a very least maintenance type of ground covers that would actually, you know, prevent people from trashing the area. And then uh, about the cigarette butts issue, there's some other issue that we're working concurrently on how to address that issue as well. So, so uh, we, we've had success, right? And we had success with the tree planting program, and we have success on the frontage road on El Camino on ground cover, and also um, just on Broadway, just south of Meadow Glen. And so working with Key and his staff, we're going to just take that and, and, and start to repeat it um, where we've been successful. So the street trees and great, some of the ground cover, I think that Council Member Pappen is referring to, we know it works, we know it thrives, and that's the theme and, and pattern that we're gonna continue with. And that's kind of what our message was this evening, that we're gonna continue with, with what has worked in pilot programs, and that will be our central landscaping theme for downtown. Is it um, by any chance, I'm going to assume that it is drought tolerant. Do we know if any of it's California native and do we know if any of it will support pollinators? Uh, I would think that we would like to meet all the requirements. They may not be native, but they will be climate appropriate for the area there. Okay. And then before I go tonight, uh, I do have a question. If you can see on the pictures on the left-hand side, there's a bulletin board. We have, staff recently have sort of gathered around the area looking at the bulletin board, and it does need some TLC, but we don't know who actually installed that. I think it has some history it's behind it. Uh, it's the Chamber, the Chamber of Commerce. Of Commerce. Okay, I, we'll deal with them with that. I, I heard that the, the Quigs are the ones who actually update it. Dan and Kathy Quigg. So I was afraid to touch it. Item sometime in our past, and I. I uh, that's what I heard. Is they're the ones that put up hmm. stuff there. And I, I will start with the chamber, and thank you very much. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and that was an informational item, so no vote needed. Uh, next, we have uh, item 15: adopt a resolution approving the submittal of an application for the regional trails program. Should we take 15 and 16 together? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's begin with 15, but take them together. Are you doing this one first? No, I'll do the other one first. What are you doing, too? Control. Oh, thank you. 
Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. I will be as quick as possible here with getting the point across. The The first presentation here is regarding the Recreational Trails Program, and that is a... Uh, a federal grant that um, authorizes funds to the states. It started um, to help and develop and maintain recreational trails for motorized and non-motorized purposes. So the funds come from the Federal Highway Trust and it's uh, $270 million per year, but California's um, portion of that is 5.7 million and that is further divided down to about one and a half million for this specific grant program. And the uh, the max that you can apply for is... Speaking closer to the microphone, please. Sorry. The, the It is a 12% match, which can be with in-kind funds, so that is labor uh, and services provided by, by staff. So the specific grant project would be for the Upper Spur Trail Development Area, and we're calling it that, but it, it's what you might have heard is being called Spur Trail Phase 3. So Lamita Avenue to the north, and then the area adjacent to Green Hills Golf Course next to Banbury Avenue on the south. So if you've been over there, you've probably noticed that there's already a dirt trail there, so this would be significant improvement. Um, key, I believe, decomposed granite a decomposed granite pathway, as well as trailhead improvements and signage. So hiking there would be an out and back, no, nothing of a, a through trail hike or any sort of loop. Uh, as I said here, signage, grading, paving, and landscaping for the trailhead, as well as 2,400 linear feet of decomposed granite trail. You can see the imaging here. If you've been along Lamita Avenue, you can see that that is the trailhead. There are very small dirt paths up to um, the terminus there of the hill, and then it widens up to about a six to 10 foot wide dirt path. And you can see the, the blue line is where it would uh, cycle through. So the total project cost is $210,000. And so with a 12% match, that would be in with in-kind, uh, with services, that would be um, a grant application of $185,000. And so the, the match would be the $25,000, which is has been specifically, um, with it's, it's in the budget, the um, parks budget for uh, maintenance along the trails, but if we are improving the trails, we no longer have to do that maintenance. So that would be um, put towards the labor for improving the trail. Any questions specifically about this grant? Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Schoener. Um, this is based on my experience of grading grants through the BPAC, but also that I used to give grants for the city of San Jose. Did the this entity give you a, a scoring criteria at have, ahead of time? There is a there is a grant guide, yes. So the reason I bring that up is um, I understand the 25%, and I'll, I would encourage strongly, if we can, to come up with some more in-kind. We've had community volunteer days. Maybe we throw some of that in, because when we're scoring the BPAC grants, you get a certain number of points if you make the bare minimum, so in this case, 12%, or 20%, or 25%. And, you know, given that Millbrae has lost more than we've gotten from the bicycle pedestrian grants, even with myself, former Councilwoman Cola Pietro, and school principal Dana Lujan on it, um, sometimes you've got to be as competitive as you can. So if we can do that, I think that might help us. Yes, I'll review with Key, and we can see what the actual um, amount would be to We, we look at all the ones it. that are just the bare minimum, and we say, golly, they really don't want it, do they? That's kind of what goes through your head. So we, we just noticed that we could make that match, so we will actually calculate the, the appropriate match. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Pepin. Uh, how does this relate to that um, other project we were talking about, the one near the skate park? That, that's the next. Oh, the sorry. Next Excuse me. I got ahead. Uh, good job on this, though. We like grant money, so thank you. Any questions on this one? Yeah, I think this is a great project, well overdue, and would like to see this get done. Um, Let's take it. Let's take it all as as one. Uh, you, you, however, it does it would terminate at Banbury Lane? What would be Banbury? Banbury, Banbury yes. Banbury. What would be 
the needed to actually complete the spur trail and uh, beginning estimations and, and the reason that we did not add this into this project is because the this total grant pot is about a million and a half and so we we didn't want to take up all of this so grant it's, pot. It's over over ten percent of the grant pot for our, our small city here. Exactly. <laughs> um, I believe and Key you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe going all the way over to Larkspur would be at about a million dollars um, just because of the significant um, grading that would have to take place and is very dense brush as well. And then about another five hundred to seven hundred fifty thousand going from Larkspur to Helen. Okay, wow. so um, yeah, a, a lot of work to do. To hope to keep that in our capital plan in some capacity. But um, great to see this uh, get underway, and hopefully we get this grant. Okay, let's move to the next one, and we'll take them as one motion afterwards. All right, this next one encompasses two different resolutions applications for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So just some background that uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund was established in 1963, and it is uh, administered by the National Park Service at a federal level, and those funds are allocated to the states from there. I do not know the exact amount. I could not find it exactly. It seems like there are funds that are allocated, and then California is able to, to grant a little bit more. So in the range of probably 14 to 16 million would be allocated to California. And then once the, the project is complete and the funds are allocated, this, this land within the boundary area of the map um, becomes federally protected into perpetuity. So you might remember, I believe back in 2000 or 2002, the skate park uh, was funded with uh, a grant that is feder uh, federally protects the skate park and also Central Park, I believe, was as well. So, the first project is, and, and then the title might throw you off, it, but naming it this specifically for the purposes of the grant project, um, but the Western Central Park Outdoor Space Project, which simply means the Recreation Center Outdoor Space, which is a project that has already been approved. So this would be uh, utilizing the funds that we already have from insurance, um, specifically from insurance to to try to maximize to get more funding and so the the recreation center paseo the uh, community room patio the fitness patio uh, parking lots lighting bioretention swale landscaping and hardscaping amounted to the range of about three and a half million dollars and so and as well as a tennis court resurfacing which was already an approved project before the fire but it amounts to three and a half million dollars so that ask since it is a 50 percent match would be 1.75 million for this project but it is no fiscal impact because these are funds that are already um, allocated and I'll move forward on that and then I'll come back to the other product. So you can see right here, this is the site plan that Group 4 has put together. So it includes everything as well as the, the tennis course space that is not, not highlighted there. So all of the highlighted area would be within this project. And then moving back here to the Millbury Skate Park renovation and fitness court project. So as I mentioned before, the skate park is already federally protected. And so if we were to just take the skate park as a standalone project, we would not receive any points for the acreage to be federally protected. So adding on another portion of land would allow this to be federally protected. And I will have to include uh, an application within this application requesting that a smaller space is... Um, that the boundary map is made smaller. Otherwise, I will want to include the, the entirety of the spur trail section there between uh, Millbrae Avenue and Ashton. So I will request a smaller space, and I believe that it would be hopefully approved since they have done that before with the skate park specifically. Uh, so the project already would the project would include the already approved fitness court. And some good news with the fitness court, uh, as you know from um, presenting before, we received thirty thousand dollars from the national fitness campaign for that fitness court. So that would be used towards this match. We also recently received fifty thousand dollars from the Peninsula Healthcare District for this fitness court, and also just received five thousand dollars from the Lions Club. So. Um, for the portion of the fitness court, we uh, need to continue to raise about $46,000 more for that. But putting it with uh, the skate park renovation would allow it to, um, the fitness court funds to be used towards the match with the skate park, and they would be helping each other out, both of these projects. And then the rest of the, the funding, the 50% match, would come from Prop 68 per capita funds. 
and the more that we fund towards the fitness court, the less uh, that would be used from the Prop 68 per capita funds. And, and just another um, heads up with uh, the skate park user group that has recently been formed. The skate park has, um, it was in need of dire repair before, but it's been really being, been taken care of lately. And we have noticed um, and gotten a lot of feedback from the skate park users that they would like to see improvements done. Uh, there were some dilapidated wooden ramps. And so this renovation would take care to put in concrete ramps that would last longer. And you can see here the the skate park. That is a rendition uh, of an up, the updated renovated skate park with the square next to it would be where the fitness court would go. So directly adjacent. So having access to bathrooms and water. So the uh, Recreation Center Outdoor Space Project, as I mentioned before, is three and a half million dollars with 1.75 million as this grant application uh, with the 50% match being funded by the insurance. And then the skate park renovation and fitness court project would be in the range of 470,000 with a match uh, a grant request of 235,000. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, is that complete? Yes, that, that completes, okay. completes that. And just as a reminder, with the Land and Water Conservation Fund, these areas would be protected into perpetuity. And the only way to change the nature of the use of this land would be to um, put in an application requesting that. So just, just to follow up on that, I, I remember when this had come up before at the, the Parks and Rec Commission, the, the fitness court, there was the idea that possibly it could be moved because it's all on foam pads, um, but if this were grant were approved, that could not be the case, or the land would be federally? Uh, the, the land would be federally protected as well as the equipment, uh, and the land use could not be changed outside of outdoor recreation purposes. Okay, so we would... I would have to look further into that. Okay, well, that's, that's a minor thing, and it's... I think, you know. I think there is a mechanism, though, as, as McKenzie stated, if we were to move it, that we could write a letter and apply and, and get the approval for relocating. So there, there is a mechanism in a... And I imagine plan. that if you move the equipment, now that equipment is federally protected in a new location, but also the land where it originally was would, would continue to be protected for outdoor recreation purposes. Fair enough. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider? I'm sorry. I, now I remember what I should have told both of you. Um, just for the record, um, I have clearance from the Secretary of State from the Fair Political Practices see uh, to talk about and vote on things at the park. So since one of these grants is the West Central Park, I still have the ability to vote on it because I live within 500 feet of the very corner of the park on Palm Avenue. So just make sure that's in the record. And with the skateboard renovation, would that include artwork? That would be an additional, okay. additional activity by cultural arts. Okay. Uh, no, they want to work with the skateboard committee. And I've taken some great photos of skate parts when I was traveling this year. There's some really fun stuff happening. That, that renovation would specifically just be uh, the installation of the cement ramps um, okay. and I believe smoothing out and grading some of the, the metal facade within, within the okay, skate Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Councilwoman Pepin. Can we be clear for the record here, this proposal, these matching funds, everything, we are not spending money taking away from the community center. Correct. Yes. Okay. Point one. Uh, point two, uh, the rumor mill is already a muck about this fitness court project. So can the city please release some accurate information as to what we are trying to achieve here and what will this entail? So we... Do not hear from the community. Oh, they're just, you know, spending money every which way, and this is actually a good investment, I think. Um, Rumors from people who aren't here right now to, to 
talk about it. Yeah, yes, yeah, I've, I've heard from some parents. What is this? And people are already speculating in the wrong way. I think this is a nice project, and if we can get that out to the public, um, it will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And again, this these projects will be 100% grant funded, but using the money that we already have Match. For so a match, yes, order. and and there, and there is no, we are not jeopardizing. As a matter of fact, I'd say we're enhancing um, the payment capacity of the recreation center because if we receive this one grant, then that actually saves more money for FF and E and other things. Many at, of those the, um, improvements are included in the existing budget that we're working with, right? That's correct. Yep. Okay, we have a motion from Councilwoman Pappin and a second from Councilman Lee. Uh, your votes, please. Items number 15 and 16 passed unanimously. Okay, um, thank you. Um, next, we will go to council comments, and it is getting late, and we've been on break for a while, so if we can keep these very brief, that would be uh, appreciated. Um, let's start with um, Councilwoman Pappin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, real quick, please, there is a blood drive um, demand right now. They are in dire need of contributions. Please take the time. The blood bank has moved, so no longer in Millbrae there. I believe it's in San Mateo, uh, what I looked up, 48th. Sec 48th Second Avenue, San Mateo. Um, we are approaching, and you will all hear more likely, and I'm sure we'll have more on the census. So I hope we get more briefings um, and work with all community-based organizations to promote the census because everybody needs to be counted and the information is strictly confidential. We don't want misinformation out there. If you have any questions, I hope we can develop a hotline where we can accurately answer those questions. The census is very important. Um, I've, I'm trying to follow up with the city as to striping on Magnolia and Murchison. The street is pretty wide there and evidently it gets pretty crowded in the mornings because people can't decide whether it's two lanes uh, heading to the east, to the west, excuse me. So I'm hoping that will be resolved soon. I, I explained earlier why, as your representative on NTC, I voted no to giving BART an additional $35 million. And hopefully we'll get a memo out on that one. The Millbrae Education Foundation Gala is coming up February 29th. That's leap year. So we hope everybody will work to support that. And um, I tried out the Quick Quack, quick quack Car Wash, um, which was very good, I've got to say. Uh, for a while there, they were giving free car washes. And I think they're still running a special $9.99. Um, you can actually pay $39 and I think go as often as you'd like for a month. Um, so that's kind of how they operate. I recommend people try that out. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. Sure, um, just to update council, uh, Key Lim, uh, John Giannoli, myself, and the Chair of Community Enhancement walked the BART parking lot last week looking at trees that could potentially be reused and relocated. There's some very healthy magnolias that could be, as we talked to our Parks Department along the Monterey Park on that. There are some, I always get the sycamore, it's got a specific species name, but sycamores and another tree species. And then there are quite a few palm trees which we, that Parks felt that we don't really have a place for, for the palm trees. Now it is unclear if, who actually owns those trees, if Bart owns them or if um, the developer owns them. I've several times talked to the developer about tree reuse where they're somewhat ambivalent. We didn't get this into the developer agreement, so this is gonna be a after the fact negotiation to try to recover the trees, and that is a project kind of going on right now. Um, in addition, Public Works and Key have brought on a tree evaluator. They looked at the trees on the back side of the Bart parking garage, and I know that the neighborhood, Bayside Manor, is very attached to those trees. Some of them are dead, some of them are dying and will be removed, but hopefully the redwood trees and things that give you a greenscape along there instead of looking at cement will remain, but just so that that neighborhood knows that Parks or Public Works has been working on that. 
I've talked enough about Peninsula Clean Energy, um, other than City of Millbury, we need to be right there for the resiliency funding. And that probably has to do with um, maintaining centers. If the power goes off, how do we keep our, our seniors and our people on medical devices safe during that time? Um, the Millbrae Cultural Arts Advisory Committee met yesterday. They have their new member, and uh, I know we've got Mackenzie in the audience, but they have already come up with a new schedule that's very exciting on Beats and Brews. I don't know if you need our permission, but Beats and Brews is going to be moving from the third Thursday to the first Thursday. I would like to think it's so that Councilwoman Pappen can attend because of CCAG, but they told me it's really so that staff can better manage their time with the movie night being on the third night. But I still think it's for CCAG because that was that was horrible that you didn't get to attend any of them because they were really fun. And they've got this whole new music program which they should report on. It's alternative right now, but there are a couple of new different varieties of music. And for everybody on next door, something designed for Oktoberfest. So really great excitement on that. And I thank you uh, to Mackenzie who came and spoke to the Cultural Arts Committee on that. Um, Roses. What we didn't know, but we are getting closer. Someday we will be breaking ground on the recreation center. But there was a rose garden that was built by the senior center doorway to the old rec center. And it turns out that our very own John Giannoli has a friend who runs a nursery. And way back then, they made a great deal to bring these roses in with the intent that the seniors would be able to learn how to prune roses on there. Well, those there are still 25 of them alive. They've survived basically three years of being neglected. Uh, chair of the Community Enhancement Committee, Parks let um, she and I in there last Friday. We pruned them all to get ready for moving them. Roses should be moved in the wintertime when they're in theory dormant. They were already starting to leaf out. But we will be moving those roses on Monday. And I thank the mayor for the approval of Millbrae's first Martin Luther King Community, Community Day of Service. If you would like to join us, it'll be Monday. Uh, from 10 to 12, meet at the top of uh, the doorways basically of the new community garden where you can see a lot of changes that parks have put in. They put in additional walkway. They're getting ready to do a pollinator garden. Uh, a Boy Scout is going to be putting citrus trees in over the next couple of months. But the goal of Monday's project is to dig up these old roses, transplant them to the new location. If we get a lot of volunteers, there's quite there's some litter that has built up in the fence around the burnt, the, the old rec center. So we'll walk through and we'll clean that up so that people walking on the street don't see, sadly, liquor bottles um, thrown over the fence. And, um, you know, a few other things to basically try to recover or save anything from the old rec center before construction begins. So I thank the mayor for that. It's Millbury's very first Martin Luther King Community Day. Hope you'll join us 10 to 12. Please bring water. Please bring your own gloves. We have gloves, but bring your own gloves. And if you happen to have a set of small clippers, this isn't for the roses, but if we find anything else we have to move, we only have a couple of, of clippers. Parks will be providing shovels and the, the soil improvements, and um, it should be a community day, hopefully as much fun as when we built the garden. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Oliva? Sure. So um, I, do, I want to go tell you on. One more time, I want to say how important that census is, so please everybody take that very, very seriously. Um, over the holiday season, I want to share something that I was able to do with this uh, Sal League on the board I sit on, the Sheriff's Activity League. Uh, we delivered gifts um, with the sheriffs to a huge amount of families. Um, I was in Redwood City and I was able to take my husband who brought his guitar and sang to um, at least 15 families that we went to go visit and deliver gifts to. So thank you for that opportunity and I'm very, very honored and I hope I represented Millbury well with that. Um, I also wanted to share that um, the Lunar New Year Parade is coming up on the 26th in Millbrae, and I'm sure I'll see all of you there, and everybody else will enjoy that as well. And then we'll follow with the New Year's with the Rotary Club on February 7th at, um, where is it? Where's the dinner? Uh, Zen Peninsula. Thank you. And um, I hope that everybody here will be attending as well. And then lastly, but not leastly, happy birthday, Council Member Wayne Lee. 
Thank you. And uh, Councilman, maybe um, you can see if Chobe can open for uh, the Beats and Brews this year. Yeah. Uh, I might have to take a permit out every week in my house for what goes on there. <laughs> All right, uh, Councilman Lee? Uh, yes, thank you for your well wishes. Um, um, let's see, uh, I think I covered everything, that's awesome. Um, but the parade will start, at, the Lunar Year Parade will start at, on Sunday 26 at 11.30 um, at the Living Spaces, and there will be a show, I think we were closing Broadway and what, Taylor, is it? Just that one block? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, there will be a stage and entertainment and food. Um, again, congratulations to retirement of Chief Kennemeyer, um, and uh, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, if we can close in honor of uh, Glenn, Mayor Glenn Sylvester, his mother passed away, da the mayor of Daly City, Linda um, Mangelso. I just, I sent, uh, Elaine I, and Alana, I sent you the, uh, I sent you the, her name. Okay, thank you very much and, uh, and a happy, happy new decade, everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, we are trying to move uh, right along into our, um, get a good an early start on our goal setting for the year. Um, and we have uh, proposed the date of February 4th. I know it's the same evening as Community Enhancement Committee, um, but we'd like to get going on this sooner rather than later. We have a, uh, a facilitator who's um, available on that date. Um, and uh, hopefully we can have the council there, so please get back um, to, on the email if, if you are available that day. We're also put in preparation for that goal setting meeting at our next council meeting. We're planning a 6 p.m. kind of a recap as to what we've accomplished during the past year and um, just to kind of help get everyone um, into help everyone think about what we'd like to add to our goals um, for the coming year. So not so much of, a, of an interactive um, type of, of meeting, but more of a presentation on, you know, what we've accomplished and where we are on goals that we've set over the last year or two. Um, so hope to see you all there. That'll be at, at 6 p.m. before our next council meeting on January 28th. Um, and yeah, we'd like to close, uh, oh, sorry? I'm oh, sorry. The Millbury Lions Crab Feed is the day before the Lunar Festival, which is January 25th. So if you need, if, if you want tickets, please find any lion. They can tell you how to go about getting tickets. Yes, we have a, a busy schedule, and I think maybe that'll be one of the first items of business with the coord Civic Coordinating Council to <laughs> see if some of the events can be spaced out a little bit. But, it, but it's nice to have, to have all these events going on um, at the beginning of the year. Um, so, yes, in honor, in closing of the meeting, um, in addition to Glenn Sylvester's mother, Linda Mangalso, um, we also have lost uh, Jim Fox, the former mm. San Mateo County District Attorney, had passed away. I'd like to close in his honor. Um, also, Joseph Quatt, a longtime uh, Millbury resident. He was a member of CERT and the Millbury Amateur Radio Club. Um, also a founder of the Neighborhood Watch on Pinon Avenue um, and helped with the fire assessment. And also uh, Darlene Reinhardt, who is the former owner mm -hmm. of uh, Zach's Bar and Grill, if you remember mm -hmm. uh, the old Zach's here in Millbrae. Um, so we um, give our, our thoughts and our sympathies to the uh, families of, of those that we've lost. And, uh, sorry, uh, Councilman Lee? Well, I want to do it on a brighter side. I want to congratulate our city attorneys on her grand granddaughter, new granddaughter. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we will also close in honor of uh, the, the granddaughters. Okay. And um, with that, we will adjourn, and we will be back on January 28th. Thank you.
Disorders are widespread, as are psychiatric disabilities from birth. In industrialized nations, there are just 100 psychiatrists to every 100,000 people. But that seems like a luxury compared to poor countries, where often one psychiatrist struggles to support the same number. That applies to 45% of the global population. Mental health issues can make securing a job nigh on impossible, though not in Israel. It's Elisha's job to take dogs for a walk. He has a soft spot for canines, but he especially likes the shape this work lends to his life. It gives me 